This is Atomic Shinobi and today I am going to narrate fifth part of what if neglect Naruto was a generational genius. If you enjoyed this video, please like, share and subscribe to this channel. Now wasting no more time, let's start the story. I missed this bed. Naruto mumbled joyfully as he rolled over on the covers of his big bed while wearing his pajamas. He had just returned from the Guardians and had been enjoying seeing everyone again since he was granted some time off a few days ago. In order to find out what transpired during his absence and what new information he had discovered, Tsunade, Hiruzen, and Shizune had essentially locked him up in the Sarutobi Manor. However, he just tapped his nose when they discussed how his Mokudan was growing. That is a secret, he then went to see Makoto, who gave him a death, defying hug because she had missed her student so much. She also pushed him for information, just like the others did. It frightened him to see little Rhea, who bore a striking resemblance to Makoto. However, Sasuke had seen him once and snorted before turning to head for his training ground in the compound. That stick was still stuck up Itachi's little brother's ass when he visited. However, he was a little disappointed that Itachi and Anko were not present. Both, along with Yugao and Hana, were on missions. Hana was now a Jonin, and both girls had grown during his absence. Yugao joined the Anbu and was commanded by Itachi. However, Makoto simply giggled into Itachi's hand when he asked where she was, saying he was preoccupied with another personal issue without providing any further information. Naruto woke up and went to eat breakfast after realizing that it was almost 11 o'clock and that he had slept in enough for one day. He asked out loud, cereal or toast? Before choosing cereal, he took a seat at the table after finishing his breakfast. He was about to bite into it when the door slammed and two figures rushed in. He was staring at what was likely the sexiest scene he had ever seen in his life, and it took all of his willpower not to blush. Anko had kicked the door open and was kissing Hana in Azuka, who, like Anko, had grown taller, more womanly, and had grown out her hair into a long ponytail that ran down her back. Anko was wearing a gown that was a little taller and definitely more feminine than before. Because they were too busy feeling each other's bodies, neither girl even realized he was seated at the table. Before Anko snarled and tore Hannah's top off, exposing white tape around her breasts, she threw off her tan coat. Anko tore those off in a flash, then her hands started caressing the Inazuka's breasts. Before Anko twisted them around and shoved her onto the table, Hannah let out a loud moan. Anko then bit down on her breasts, giving her a rush of pleasure. Anko played with Hannah's breasts for a moment before removing her top and starting to move down her body. She was just about to remove her pants when Naruto finally spoke up. What do you know? Breakfast and a show. The two girls came to a complete halt and opened their eyes. As they glanced in front of them, they noticed Naruto grinning and holding a spoonful of cereal in front of them before consuming it. Both of the girls screamed after a brief silence. One in awe and one in delight. Before grabbing a cushion from the sofa, Hannah hurriedly wrapped her arms around her breasts in an attempt to cover herself after getting up from the table. In the meantime, Anko rushed across the table, pressed herself up against her best friend, and gave him a tight hug. Anko's amazing possessions were almost hitting Naruto in the face. Anko still struggled with subtlety. She leaned out and gave him a shaky smile, saying, You bastard, when did you get back? You don't know how much we've missed you. Just a few days ago. I guess you guys were on a mission. Hello by the way Hannah. Chan. Hannah scratched the back of her head and said, Hey Naruto, laughing uneasily. Anko broke the hug but remained on his lap, saying, I would have stayed if I knew you were coming back. You should have told us. Sorry but I wanted it to be a surprise. My family was happy to see me as was Sensei and everyone else. Now I'm just looking for that Uchiha we all know and love. Ah yeah good. Ol Itachi, I'm sure you will see him at some point. He's not here much other than to sleep and when he is not at the Anbu station or on patrol then he would be at the Uchiha compound since he is the heir. Naruto questioned, still as stoic as ever. He looked at her bewilderedly, but he knew Anko would not reveal the truth. Of course this is Itachi after all. Though you will be getting a surprise when you see him, she said. What were she and his sensei concealing, he wondered. So you too huh, must admit Anko I am not surprised since I saw this coming but you Hannah. I did not know you swayed that way. Hannah took Anko's hand in hers and made him smile. I didn't until a year ago. Anko got me drunk after a successful mission and we spent the night together. I remembered most of it and I found myself enjoying it. So we hooked up more and more until eventually we just decided to become girlfriends. 
Naruto shook his head in response to her question, it's not a problem is it? No Hana. Chan it's no problem. I am very happy you two found love with one another. How is your mother taking this relationship anyway? She took it pretty well actually. Shocked at first as you would expect but she said as long as one day I can give her a grand pup to spoil by some means then she is all for it. In fact a lot of my clan are okay with it as are a lot of the other shinobi and we have not had many people act hatefully towards us which is very fortunate. The only person who is being a pain is my runt of a brother Kiba. Naruto gave a snort. As Anko smiled and gave them the thumbs up, he said, that's probably because you landed a hot piece of ass like Anko where he didn't. Naruto shook his head and Anko said, damn right. So do you have a girl in your life Naruto? You must by now. Naruto lied while Anko shook her head, saying, no not right now. There was a girl or two that caught my eye, I guess you could say but nothing came of them. Anko gestured to her body and said, well, unless you were hoping to get a go on this again, hurry up and get one. Sorry Naruto, but I'm Hannah's now. I am heartbroken Anko. Chan, but I think I will survive. Hannah yelled next to her as Anko lifted her up in a fireman's carry and then slapped her ass. Good now, it's been great seeing you again and I am glad you are home, but it's been a week since I last had sex and I got to get my desires out. You might want to leave since we won't be stopping until tomorrow morning, Anko yelled as she hurried into her room down the hallway. He hurriedly finished his breakfast, changed into new clothes, and left the apartment as Hannah's groans started to reverberate throughout the house, saying, and that is my cue to leave. That's it my hubby. Haim, put it right there. Alongside Naruto, Naruto headed for his parents' house, where he knew the twins would be at the moment, since he had nothing better to do. The twins had a week off from the academy after graduating, but they still had to return to find out which teams they would be on. Naruto didn't think it was a good idea, even though they both wanted to be together. They both needed to develop their independence and learn to live without each other's constant support. He was aware that it was a challenging process for twins, but it was essential in the shinobi world. As he approached the Namikaze residence, he sensed that Mino was at the academy right now and that both of his parents were not there. Mito, Eiji you guys here, he yelled, and a torpedoed blonde slammed into him in a flash. Mito joyfully called out, Ni, Chan, as she gave her brother a hug, and Eiji emerged from the kitchen more slowly. Well you seem happy to see me, what's the occasion? His sister's eyes were sparkling as she gazed up at him. Ka, Chan has been teaching me some really cool techniques with the sword you got me. As his younger brother gave him the thumbs up, he said, really? Well that is good. How are these kanai coming along Eiji? Good. 2.san is showing me how to use them in his spare time. I think I am getting the hang of them. He teased them a little and smiled inwardly when he saw Mito and Eiji's eyes light up with passion. That's very good as well. I'm glad you both are using the gifts I gave you. If you are not doing anything, do you two want to go to one of the training grounds with me? I want to see just how far along my cute little brother and sister has come in their shinobi skills. Unless you're scared to battle me that is. Both twins yelled at him, hell no, we can kick your ass knee, San. As they hurried upstairs to get their gear and put on their shinobi uniform. They are too easy a, Naruto grinned despite his mutter. If you looked closely at them, you could see how different they could be, even though they were twins. Like Minato, Eiji was more of a thinker and the more composed of the two. Similar to Kashina, Mito was vivacious but a little hot, headed. However, if you put those two together, you might have a formidable little team. He waited for a few minutes while leaning against the wall and listening to Mito and Eiji get ready. They both yelled out what they needed to bring and what they should remember. They weren't being very stealthy. With only a few others in their year being younger than 12, they were both among the oldest at 13. Eiji and Mito had their own rooms now. Mito was given his old room, but Eiji was given their original room. A few minutes later, both twins bounded down the stairs, ready and equipped, wearing their new headbands with pride. Eiji was dressed in a grey mesh top, a whitish grey jacket, and dark blue pants and black shinobi sandals. His new three. Prong Kanai was in a Kanai holder strapped to his right leg. He had the Uzumaki symbol on the side of his jacket. Mito, on the other hand, framed her face with her bangs and had her long blonde hair tied in a braid. In addition to a dark orange shirt with black outlines and a light mesh shirt underneath, she wore black shinobi sandals with black bottoms. Her new katana and the uzumaki symbol were on her back. Naruto remarked, orange, interesting color, 
It was undoubtedly a striking hue to wear outside. She pouted and Naruto raised his hands in surrender, saying, Don't you start too, I like it and that is how it will stay. As he pushed them both out, he opened the door and said, It's fine. It looks very nice. Eiji remarked, Ni, Chan, won't you need your gear? Because Naruto was only dressed in civilian clothes. The twins wanted to kick his ass even more when he playfully said, Don't worry Eiji, I won't be needing it. Every civilian on the street grinned as they watched the twins warn Naruto that they would beat him severely, but Naruto simply kept a small smile on his face the whole time. Ground of Training 11 Mito and Eiji were standing slightly in front of Naruto, who muttered as he surveyed the large field, here we are this should do nicely. They could use the entire width of the training field because no one else was using it. As they both nodded, Naruto questioned, now are you both ready for this? Well since you two have just turned genin to make this a bit fairer I will only use taijutsu and kenjutsu. You two though can use whatever tricks you want, he said while both of them nodded. As both of them swallowed and gave a slight nod, he said gravely, I want you both to treat me like an enemy. If you don't come at me with the intent to kill then you might as well walk home now. Good, he said, reaching to his right hand and opening a katana that had never been seen by either of the twins. One half of the sheath was green, and the other half was white. It had a green handle and a guard with four petals. Mito examined the blade with interest and said, I have never seen that one before Ni, Chan. Is it new? That's right, it was a gift the fire daimyo had made for me just before my time as one of the guardians was up. As a way of thanking me for my service and for protecting his family he presented me with this katana he had made from Iron Country just like your weapons and my Shisui. I have had some practice with it, but I think it would be better to use now than Shisui. Trust me when I say Shisui is not a blade you two are ready to go against yet. He said as they both gulped. As Eiji and Mito assumed their fighting positions and Eiji prepared to try. Prong Kanai in his hands, he asked, you both ready? Mito pulled out her sword. As Naruto stood there, one hand in his pocket and the other gripping his new blade Shigur, the wind blew through the field. Eiji and Mito narrowed their eyes at him, and he grinned. Begin. It should come as no surprise that Mito moved forward first and approached him at a high genin level of speed. Naruto effortlessly sidestepped out of her way as she swung her blade down at him. He dodged the slash and moved out of the way as she swung at him once more. The following blow, however, was a spin by Naruto who moved behind Mito and lightly struck her back leg with the sugar sheath. When he did, Mito staggered forward slightly. Shortly afterward, he felt Eiji approaching from behind, his kanai positioned in front of him. With ease, Naruto stepped aside and seized his younger brother's arms before hurling him into the air in the direction he had targeted. However, Eiji was able to flip in midair and land upright. Naruto easily deflected a few standard kanai that Eiji threw at him with his blade, which was still sheathed at this point. He leapt into the air, avoiding a sword strike, and landed next to her, grabbing her shoulder and tossing her to Eiji as he sensed Mito approaching from behind. Naruto just caught the shuriken between his fingers as Eiji threw a couple of them at him. Mito sighed in frustration and rubbed his sister's shoulder while Eiji lifted her into his arms and helped her stand. Eiji asked his sister, together. And she nodded. Together. The twins now approached him in a zigzag pattern, clearly attempting to mislead him as to who would attack first. When he noticed that Mito had attempted to use her blade to take him down once more, he was not shocked. However, Naruto smirked at her before deflecting the blow with his blade's sheath, twisting her around, and then jabbing her in the back with the sheath, sending her flying forward once more. Quickly, he saw Eiji emerge a few meters above him, making a few hand signals, and he smiled at his younger sister as she fell to the ground and pouted at him. Eiji yelled, Raiden, Reiku. As a lightning cloud the size of his fists formed between his palms. Before launching the lightning ball at Naruto, he swiftly stabilized the jutsu. Affinity for lightning, huh? Since he assumed Eiji would have either wind or water, Naruto reasoned that this was not the case. Eiji and Mito smiled, thinking they had their older brother, but their smiles were quickly erased when they noticed their brother's katana wrapped in a wind aura before he made a single cut in the direction of the lightning ball. The ball dissipated after being cut in half by the slash. Eiji was winding down when Naruto suddenly materialized in front of him and struck him in the stomach with the handle of his katana. Mito appeared behind Naruto, her katana sheathed, ready to use taijutsu on him before he could strike him again. All right little sister, show me what you can do. Before launching punches and quick kicks at her older brother, Mito concentrated on him. 
she targeted the areas of the head, stomach, and chest that her mother had stated would sustain the most harm. However, when Naruto either avoided or caught the blows, her frustration grew. Mito became increasingly irate and yelled, stop dodging all the time. Without realizing that her blows were becoming sloppy and slower, Naruto was putting a wire strap around her, but she was too furious to notice. Eiji called, Mito pay attention to what he is doing, as he had just noticed Naruto's actions. Mito called in bewilderment, what? Before abruptly losing her weight and hanging upside down in a tree. She didn't realize that Naruto had guided her to a tree and was quietly encircling it with a ninja wire trap as she attempted to attack him. Mito grinned nervously and scratched the back of her head, saying, oh so that's what you mean to. Naruto prodded his sister in the stomach, causing her to giggle a little, and said, you need to pay more attention to your surroundings. Mini, she said, crossing her arms, and then her eyes widened as a barrage of shuriken struck Naruto in the back, causing him to fall forward. Mito exclaimed, Oni, Chan, as she saw her brother collapse to the ground, and Eiji appeared somewhat stunned. He didn't believe it was going to strike. But before either could act, Naruto abruptly poofed away, exposing it as a mere clone. When they realized it was a ruse, they both asked, a bunchin. Naruto said, yep and you fell for it little brother, as he emerged behind Eiji. His try. Prong Kanai surged towards his younger brother, who responded as fast as he could. He sat on top of him, but Naruto swiftly grabbed his arm, twisted it behind him, and pinned him to the ground. He patted his brother's head and said, you did not think it would be that easy did you? Eiji gave him a pout and a slight glare. Naruto laughed even harder as a result. After freeing Eiji and hurling a kanai in the direction of Mito's strong a position, Naruto remarked, not bad for the first round. Mito yelled as the wire broke and she fell hilariously to the ground. Mito yelled, Oni, Chan, as she glared at him and a bump appeared on her head. Naruto muttered, the ka, Chan flows strong in this Oniya, which caused Mito to glare at him even more and Eiji to laugh. As they attempted to devise a strategy against their brother, Eiji promptly returned to his sister. As he started to unsheathe Shigur and show Eiji and Mito the cold, hard steel of his blade, he thought, well, at least they have teamwork down. He said, right you two. Since round one is over, let's go on to round two, and Eiji and Mito both swallowed as they prepared. After an hour, as he lay on the ground next to Mito, looking worn out and sporting a few cuts and bruises all over his body as well as some rips in his clothing, Eiji cried out, I can't feel my legs. Mito was feeling the same way. When they trained with her, their brother was too much like their ka. Chan, even though they were Uzumakis and had incredible endurance. Brutal. When they looked up, Naruto was smiling down at the twins and appeared exactly as he had earlier and not even tired or scratched. Naruto laughed as they both said, we hate you. He sat down directly between them and put his hands on their heads, chirping, well, I love you guys too. They watched as Naruto started to heal them by using the Shosen Jutsu. They both felt much better than they had just moments before. Mito asked anxiously, so how did we do? As Naruto gave her a stern look before grinning. You two did pretty good actually. You lasted longer than I thought you would and your skills are definitely up to genin level. You both have a decent sized jutsu arsenal for ones your age and while your taijutsu and kenjutsu could use some work, I think you two are well on your way to being great shinobi, he said making both of them smile at him for the praise. However, I do have some suggestions for you. Eiji tries not to overanalyze every circumstance. When your intuition tells you to do something, it's usually correct. Since Kashina had previously told him the same thing, Eiji nodded as he said, there are times when you need to take chances rather than always playing it safe. Mito, you need to control your temper. Your movements become sloppy and slower as your frustration increases. Before the girl grinned up at him, he flicked her nose and said, try to remain composed even if someone is making fun of you. In order to avoid being chewed out by Kashina, Naruto stopped the Shosen Jutsu after a few minutes, and both twins got to their feet. They were still tired and couldn't wait to go to bed and rest, but they appeared fine now. Would you both like me to walk you home? Both shook their heads, indicating that they knew the way and that it wouldn't take long when he asked. Eiji and Mito said their goodbyes and gave each other a few hugs before leaving the area to go home. Naruto turned around to watch them leave and disappear from view. You can come out now. He sensed a familiar signature coming quickly toward him, and he gripped his blade tightly as he spun around and stopped the person as a tonto slammed forward, Shigur lying between them, blocking the blow. 
Naruto had no trouble identifying the individual, who was an Anbu wearing a raven mask and had long black hair tied in a thick ponytail behind him. Nice to see you have not got sloppy while I was away at Itachi. With a hint of joy at seeing his longtime friend, he said in his monotone voice, the same could be said for you and Naruto. When Itachi removed his mask to unlock weapons, he saw an older Itachi staring back at him, with the exception that the tear, shaped marks on his face were slightly deeper than before. The two grinned and gave each other hugs. I've heard that you've returned for a few days. Ka.san informed me of your return when we met a few hours ago. Indeed, Makoto. Sensei was among the first people I saw. Little Rhea has matured nicely. As Itachi joyfully nodded, he remarked, she looks exactly like Sensei. Like Ka.san, Rhea, Chan has grown up beautifully. Because he did not like the idea of boys showing interest in her in a few years, Itachi said, I am afraid I may end up beating away boys with a stick. Oh, don't worry, Rhea will be strong enough to keep them at bay, I'm sure. In addition, I am the one with two sisters here, and they will both be stunning. You'll need two sticks. Itachi simply sighed and shook his head in reference to his younger brother, saying, however, I notice little Sasuke's mood has not changed. I'm not sure how to handle him. He has obviously inherited more traits from my father than from my mother, and his obsession with defeating me and becoming the head of the clan has turned into his life's ambition. He asserts that everyone must fear the Uchiha and submit to us as though we were kings and queens. Lately, he has been acting out of control. How does he treat Rhea? Naruto inquired because he recalled how hostile Sasuke had been to his younger sister prior to his departure. Since Ka.san and I are close and Rhea generally avoids him, it's not too bad now. This prevents him from attempting anything hostile toward her. Because he isolates himself, he hardly ever talks to people and has few friends. Though from the few conversations I have had with Eiji, Sasuke may have a bit of an obsession with Mito. You don't say, Naruto said, narrowing his eyes as Itachi gave a somewhat grudging nod. Eiji has admitted to me that he frequently looks at her both inside and outside of the academy. At home, Sasuke murmurs about marriage contracts and the need for a strong wife and kids one day. He may have Mido in mind as a future wife, in my opinion. No offense here Itachi, but if the only reason Sasuke wants to marry a girl, especially my little sister because he only wants a strong wife and someone to pop out children for him then he and I are going to have a problem. Yes, I am aware that I will ensure he understands that those are not sound grounds for marriage. Because she wants to believe he is still her baby. Ka.san can be too tender with him at times. However, someone must be firm with him. I might have to reprimand him if he crosses the line once more. Makes sense, Naruto remarked as they strolled side by side, talking about their recent activities and briefly bringing up the subject of Danzo. Although the veteran Warhawk had not yet attempted anything, Itachi had been closely monitoring him, and the moment he made a mistake, he would take action. Hello, where have you been, Itachi Uchiha? A loud voice called, and Naruto turned around, somewhat reluctantly, to see a young woman standing behind them. Naruto was surprised to see Itachi go a little pale and gulp. Although she was dressed normally in dark grey pants and a light green shirt that matched her eyes, Naruto could tell she was a shinobi by the way she carried herself. She was a fair, skinned girl of average height with green eyes and waist, length black hair in a high, style cut tied in a high ponytail, with short bangs and chin length strands framing her face. How did she find me, Kami? Itachi muttered. I've been searching everywhere for you. Put an end to your constant running off. Remember how you and I are taking Rhea to the park and then getting ice cream. She said, closing the distance between them, and to Naruto's utter surprise, she took Itachi by the collar and planted a kiss on him, nearly causing him to fall to the ground. Before they split up, he saw Itachi return a brief kiss and turn to face his friend, who was staring at them with a puzzled expression. Who was this and what the devil was that, dude? Wondering if this was what Makoto and Anko had both meant earlier, Naruto asked. Naruto allow me to introduce you to Shizuka my girlfriend. As she extended her hand to greet Naruto, who shook back in a daze and only glanced at Itachi, who had a hint of red on his cheeks, Shizuka proudly said, his fianca copyright and future wife. There was silence for a few seconds, but then Naruto burst out laughing, fell to the ground, and pointed at his friend. Naruto held his breath and laughed, the emotionless Itachi Uchiha who always said he would not get a girlfriend until he was 25 is now engaged at 18, Shizuka arched an eyebrow and Itachi received a tick mark on his head. Stop talking, 
Naruto. Itachi's yell only made Naruto laugh harder. Itachi, complaining about the blonde, haired Bakus, took Shizuka's hand and they left, with Naruto pursuing them after he eventually stopped laughing long enough to understand the entire tale. That night, Naruto reflected on his day as he walked to his apartment, hoping that Hana and Anko had finally stopped making love. He couldn't help but smile at his friend Itachi. According to the story, Itachi was on a mission six months ago when he met Shizuka, who challenged him to a fight. Itachi attempted to flee, but Shizuka left him with no other option. They fought, and Itachi prevailed, it wasn't until later that Shizuka revealed to him that she was from the village of Natashiko. Not knowing what to do, he went back to Konoha with her to sort this out. He went to Makoto, who started questioning the girl right away, but to his chagrin, an hour later Shizuka and Makoto were drinking tea and laughing together, and Makoto told him to marry this girl immediately. In addition, Ria and the other Uchiha family members who were still there liked the girl because she was vivacious and could set the law. Seeing no other option, Itachi devised a compromise, as he believed that they were too young to marry, he and Shizuka would date for at least a year to get to know one another and see if there was a spark. Shizuka was dubious but agreed to the arrangement, however, after a few months, Despite Shizuka's tendency toward confrontation, Itachi started to feel something for her, and vice versa. In addition to liking Shizuka, who was a strong kunoichi and a janin in her own right, Naruto was pleased for his friend for finding love in the most unlikely of circumstances. It also seemed that his father and the village were cool with it since it meant that the Uchiha heir had found his future wife and that Konoha and the Natashiko village would have better relations. Since his own parents were proof that every strong man needed an equally strong woman to keep him in line, he believed it would be a good fit overall. Speaking of his father, he sensed that he was still in the Hokage office. Since it was unusual for him to be there at this hour, Naruto avoided shining and entered the office, where he discovered Minato seated at his desk, holding a list of Jonin and the new Genin. Hey Naruto, why are you here so late? Minato said, grinning up at his oldest. I was actually going to ask you the same thing. I'm trying to finalize the new teams for the Genin, Minato said, holding up the two rosters. There is something about them that just bothers me. With a raised eyebrow, Naruto said, you need assistance. Minato gave him a startled look before nodding in response to his question. He pulled up a chair and took a look at the team, knowing that the council would be pushing for the first half of the civilian. Born players to pass the Genin secondary exam because of the large number of clan heirs this year. When he saw his mother's name, he stopped looking at them and showed it to his father, who simply sighed. Your mother insisted on this a lot. Given the presence of the masked man, she said, Mito must always be safe. For that reason, she aspires to be the twins John and Sensei. What are your thoughts? While I have nothing against the idea, it would appear that we are playing favorites if they were both on the same team. Only Tsunade and Makoto can match your mother's strength as a kunoichi in the village. As he examined them, Naruto bit his lip, assuming he could see the reasoning behind it, but again, he did not believe the twins had to be together all the time, they needed to learn how to act independently. May I offer a suggestion? As Minato nodded, he said. By all means do, it would be nice to get a second opinion on this. With Minato looking a little taken aback, he said, then I think you should split the twins up. They may be twins, but their fighting is very different. While Mito prefers head, on, close combat, Eiji is a more technical fighter. Eiji is a cross between you and Kakashi, whereas Mito is a cross between a brawl and Ka, Chans. He started rearranging some of the names on the roster and explained, this is what I think you should doa. Naruto and Minato sat for approximately an hour talking about the teams and mingling them. They talked about everything from whether the second, Generation Ino, Shika, Cho Trio was a good idea to who they believed could survive Kashina, which made them both laugh. Both of them were so engrossed in their activities that they failed to notice Kashina peeking through the door. She looked adoringly and laughed as her husband and oldest child bonded before stealthily leaving for home. While enjoying his breakfast round at his parents' house, Naruto asked Mito and Eiji, do you both have everything you need for this morning? He no longer frequently had breakfast at his parents' house, even though Kashina insisted that he visit them every day. The twins, Mito in particular, nodded excitedly and appeared on the verge of exploding into hysterics. While Naruto merely chuckled at the twins' belief that they would go out and save princesses, Mina ate her toast next to him and listened to her older brother and sister discuss all the exciting things they were going to do now that they were shinobi. 
Since all genin were forced to submit to the Tortoise D ranks, Naruto thought, they are going to be heartbroken. With that Hellcat Tora in particular, it was almost a coming, of dot age requirement. The thought of that cat made Naruto shiver. Kashina retorted Naruto's question, are you sure you both have everything? It would not be wise to leave anything behind, especially on team assignment day, while suppressing a grin. Few people knew that Kashina was bringing in a different team, and Naruto was unsure of Mito's reaction. Since their fighting styles were similar, Mito would flourish under their mother's guidance now that she was a genin. At this point, she could truly learn the good stuff. The twins said, we have everything Ka. Chan, in unison, although it sounded more irritated because Kashina had already asked them three times. She positioned herself behind the twins and kissed the tops of their heads, causing them to both pout. I want my babies to be ready for what's coming, she said. Once more, they uttered the words, we are not babies anymore Ka. Chan, which caused Kashina to chuckle and Naruto and Mina to smile. No matter how old you get, you will always be my babies, she said, caressing the tops of their heads, causing their pouts to vanish and soft smiles to appear on their faces. Naruto nodded and hurried them from their seats, saying, it's almost 11. You two better get going. Remember be nice to your teammates, do not complain who you are with and do not disobey your sensei's orders, understand? Their headbands were proudly worn on their foreheads, and they both wore their uniforms from their day of sparring with Naruto. They also had his gifts strapped to their bodies. He said, get going munchkins, and they both embraced him before Mina approached them and gave them both sloppy good, luck kisses. Following their embrace with Kashina, which lasted for almost 30 seconds, they both headed for the front door and departed the house. Kashina muttered, they grow up way too fast, because three of her four children were now shinobi. She glanced at her youngest child. She said, Mina, Chan, don't grow up too quickly, while Mina kissed her mother's nose and giggled. Kashina started to gush over her youngest child after Mina said, okay Ka, Chan, and then she sent her upstairs to wash. Since she didn't have to be at the Hokage's office until 11.30, she started preparing her own breakfast while Naruto and she were alone in the room. This allowed her to spend some time with her oldest child. She took a seat next to him and observed him as he finished his breakfast and took a small pocket book out of his pocket. He took out a brush and started to write and draw on it. Kashina leaned over and bit into her toast. She tried to look at the page and said, What are you doing, sweetie? You seem to be concentrating hard. Naruto laughed, it's a little ceiling book. It just has stuff on ceiling and ideas of potential ceiling jutsu I come up with. I'm currently working on one at the moment and hopefully it will prove to be a success. His mother was paying close attention to him now. Her focus was on you if it had anything to do with fuinjutsu. She tried to look at the page, but Naruto kept pushing it aside. What's the idea, let me see, she said. With a pout, Kashina began to climb over her son in an attempt to reach the book. Naruto got up and held the book above his head, just to aggravate her even more. His mother, who wasn't very tall, snarled in frustration right away before stepping back a few paces and vaulting herself using the chair. She slammed into Naruto and grabbed the book as she fell. Aha! She exclaimed triumphantly, and as Naruto pouted next to her, she immediately started examining what he was working on. He said, no fair ka. Chan, as Kashina protruded her tongue at him. His eyes swept across the page as Kashina sat back up. Her interest was growing as she noticed that the current seal design combined elements of an attack, defense, and sensing seal with trap seal characteristics. She made an effort to identify it, but she was having trouble. She was quite interested in it and asked, what is this exactly? Naruto scratched the back of his head after he eventually sat up. As Kashina gave him a startled look, he explained, well, I know that for a Kunoichi one of the worst traumas is rape while out on a mission. So lately I have been trying to develop an anti-rape seal. The fear of every Kunoichi in the world was rape. Having it taken away from them by force stayed with them for the rest of their lives, and Kashina knew many former Kunoichi who had sadly gone through that. Some gave up, while others committed suicide due to the embarrassment. He said, it works like this, as he accepted Kashina's book. The seal has chakra poured into it and is then marked over the woman's virginal area. If an enemy shinobi tried to enter her forcefully then the seal will pick it up. With the sensing seal incorporated into it, it can sense whether they have good or bad intentions. If they have bad intentions then the attack and defense seal part of it will activate. 
The defense will create a thin layer of chakra to protect her womanhood while the attack seal sends out a sharp pulse of chakra which should in theory dismember him of his manhood, Naruto stated as Kashina gazed at her with awe. Her gaze shifted from Naruto to the seal and back again. This seal has the potential to revolutionize Kunoichi worldwide. This could make all the difference for us, she thought. Why hadn't anyone thought of this earlier? The idea is so straightforward, and it might be achievable with the correct Fuinjutsu skills. Minato would feel the same way about him, so she had to tell him about it later. What are your thoughts? Kashina looked at him proudly as he asked. Naruto, this is so amazing. It's possible that you have a seal that shields women everywhere. This seal demonstrates your advanced level of Fuinjutsu and is just amazing. This work is as good as it gets, so what level are you at? Despite blushing a little at the compliment, Naruto responded to her question by saying, I'm halfway through level 8, which left Kashina speechless once more. At this rate, he will surpass both Minato and me in terms of Fuinjutsu, she thought, her proud expression only growing. Level 8? I only reached level 8 by the time I was 20. Do you have anything else in here? As they read the book together, Kashina said, I would like to hear some more of your ideas, and Naruto grinned and huddled closer. An hour later wearing his shinobi gear, Naruto proceeded down the path in the direction of the Chunin exam arena. His curiosity was piqued, and Naruto wondered what his Gigi wanted after receiving a letter from Hiruzen shortly after he left his parents' house instructing him to arrive at the Chunin Stadium at this time and to arrive on time. He talked with his mother about Fuinjutsu for about 20 minutes, and he could tell she was very impressed with his ideas and work. She gave him some advice about some of them and suggested some variant seals that would be more effective for making other seals, which he listened to carefully. In terms of seals, his mother was even more proficient than his father, she was a true Uzumaki in Fuinjutsu and only Mito Uzumaki, the Shodem wife, could be better than her. Coming up with new Fuinjutsu was like porn for an Uzumaki, but she assured him that he was always welcome to ask for help or to run ideas by her. Since Kashina appeared quite thrilled about the possibility of having a second team, Naruto assumed that she was at the Hokage office right now preparing to welcome her new team. However, he suspected that she was doing it to boast that she had more teams than Makoto. There would always be rivalry between them. Naruto approached Chunin Stadium, entered through the doors that were left open for him, and started to ascend the stairs to the setting area. As soon as he stepped inside, he saw the enormous field in the middle of the stadium, which resembled the training grounds. It was perfect for training because it had rocky terrain with trees, grass, and a pool of water. Even so, he paused where he was and couldn't help but smile as he glanced down at the middle of the field. With his full battle gear and a focused expression on his face, the Sandame Hokage hears and Serutobi stood dead center in the field. Despite his advanced age, the man was still intimidating, and Naruto could sense the power radiating from him. He landed a few meters in front of Hiruzen after leaping from the stadium. I assume you're after the spar we agreed upon? It was Hiruzen's turn to smirk, so Naruto spoke. It is. Naruto, I want to see how much you've changed over the past three years. I've been looking forward to this one. On dot one time with you, and I don't intend to be as easy on you as I was when you were younger. As he removed his jacket and tossed it aside to display his strong, muscular arms, Naruto's smile remained fixed on his face. He remarked, Gigi, I would not have it any other way, as Naruto and Hiruzen started stretching. Tsunade, who had long yearned to witness this match and hoped she would get her turn against her student in due time, was standing in the cage box grinning when Naruto heard a loud voice ask, are both warriors ready? Naruto nodded and gave her the thumbs up, and Hiruzen did the same. She said, in that case, get ready, as Naruto and Hiruzen both assumed their taijutsu stances and now had a fixed expression on their faces as they inspected one another's stances. When two Chunin Izumo and Katetsu, who were currently off-duty, noticed that the stadium's doors were open and went to see Sandame Hokage and the Yandaimi's son were set to face off, with the slug Sanin serving as the match's proctor, they both had one thought in mind. After saying, we need to tell everyone, they each created a few clones and started telling the entire village about it. A thick blue barrier was set up around the field to try and contain damage and attacks as much as possible. Naruto said, I think we are going to have company, and hurriedly took a few kanai with barrier tags attached to the bottom and placed them around the arena. Naruto looked back at Hiruzen after getting up. Following a few quiet and peaceful moments, Tsunade's voice could be heard. Start, as the teacher and student started fighting. Hiruzen and Naruto both flew from their positions at high speed and slammed their fists against each other, causing a powerful shockwave to suddenly strike the area. The academy with her Naruto blade resting in her lap, 
Mito Uzumaki Namikaze sat proudly next to her best friend Ino Yamanaka, talking about unimportant topics while listening to Ino start talking about the people she would like to be with on the team and hoping they weren't all bakas. It was no secret, at least to Mito, that Ino had a major crush on her twin Eiji, who was regrettably just as oblivious as their father to the fact that a girl had feelings for him. However, she noticed that her friend kept looking in the direction of her brother. She glanced at the other people in her peer group. As was customary, Shikamaru Nara was sleeping and Shoji Akamichi was eating chips next to her. Her brother was sitting in front of them, accompanied by Kiba Inazuka and his puppy Akamaru, who was perched on top of his head. Shino Aburame, the class's perpetually silent student, was seated in the back, with the bashful Hinata Hayuga at his side. Yakumo Kurama, a pleasant girl she did not know well, and a pale boy she did not recognize were then in front of them. Then she looked at the table in front of her twins, where Sasuke Uchiha and Sakura Haruno sat with said girl in an attempt to attract the Uchiha's attention. When they were friends, Sakura Haruno was Sasuke Uchiha's biggest fangirl, and she annoyed Mito. She truly wondered how in the world she was able to pass. Then came Sasuke Uchiha, a boy who was always brooding and miserable in Mito's eyes, and who made their friendship from their younger days completely fall apart. He now took pleasure in telling people that he was stronger than they were and that everyone should submit to him because he was a member of the Uchiha clan. He was nothing like Itachi, whom Mito liked because she had known him since she was a young child and he was always kind to her. Although she was perfectly capable of holding her own, Sasuke's gaze made her uneasy, and she avoided him because it occasionally made her feel as though he was going to approach her, drag her away with him, and have his way with her. Uruka entered as she was shaking her head, and all eyes were on him. After a good 20 minutes of listening in boredom, Uruka finally reached the part they had all been anticipating. He said, now for the teams, and everyone sat up straighter as Uruka started calling out everyone's names. He announced the first six teams for a few minutes before reaching the main group. Sakura Haruno, Sasuke Uchiha, and Eiji Namikaze will make up Team 7. Kiba patted him on the back as Sakura whooped loudly at being on her crush's team. Sasuke simply grunted, and Eiji moaned at the idea of being with the fangirl and the emo. Your Jonin sensei is Kakashi Hitaki, he called. Eiji and Mito were shocked that they were not together, but he assumed he could handle it. Well, at least it's with Kakashi, he thought, assuming that was not too bad. Yakumu Kurama, Hanada Hayuga, and Shino Aburame will make up Team 8. Kurunai Yuhi is your Jonin sensei. Three Genin exchanged glances and nodded in agreement with the result. Kiba Inazuka, Shoji Akamichi, and Ino Yamanaka will make up Team 10. Asuma Serutobi will be your Jonin Sensei. Shoji gave a thumbs up to Kiba, who cheerfully gave one back, but Ino let out a quick cry of horror because she was stuck in her head with the fat kid and the flea, infested child. He said, Team 9 is still operational, before moving on to his final squad, Team 11, which is made up of Sai, Shikamaru Nara, and Mido Namikaze. Kashina Uzumaki is your Jonin Sensei. Eiji's and Mito's jaws dropped. Why ka? Chan Mito's, my sensei. The twins asked, clearly surprised, as was the rest of the class, who all knew that the twins' mother was one of the best in the village, on par with the Sanin. Sasuke became a little irate, both at not having such a strong teacher and at not being on Mito's team. In the meantime, Mito glanced at her two teammates across the room. She knew how lazy Inara could be, so she thought, Shikamaru. I can work with, but the lazy ass is going to need a push every five minutes. However, the pale child with the eerie smile on his face left her somewhat perplexed. While they were chatting, they all noticed another chunin enter the room and whisper in Aruka's ear. When they saw Aruka's expression of disbelief, everyone's eyes were on them. As the chunin gave a forceful nod, Aruka questioned, right now in the chunin stadium? As everyone's attention was at its peak, Ino questioned, Aruka. Sensei. What's happening in the Chunin Stadium? Uruka turned to face them, appearing somewhat torn, but the Chunin next to him gave him a shoulder tap. He said, Come on Uruka, when are they going to see a battle like this again? It might do them some good to see it, before leaving the room. Uruka spoke up after noticing their excited expressions. Since you're all Genin now, perhaps it would be good for you all to watch this battle. Uruka said, I just got word that the Sandame Hokage is in a sparring battle in the Chunin Stadium with the Hokage's eldest child and it seems to be getting quite heavy. Many of the shinobi are going to watch. Mito and Eiji gave him a disbelieving look before breaking out of their seats and running out of the room. After the twins, everyone else hurried out of the room. The office of the Hokage the Genin was unaware that the Hokage and numerous Janins had been observing how they responded to the team assignments. 
While the other Jonans were content with their charges, Kashina became a little irritated that she was only given Mito, but she eventually understood after hearing the justification. But they also heard Uruka's announcement, and when they looked out the window, they saw a large number of civilians and shinobi making their way to the stadium. The eldest of the Hokage was being challenged by the Sandane. When Asuma whistled, Kashina and Minato appeared somewhat stunned, obviously, none of them anticipated it. Kuranai always had a soft spot for the blonde and was the first to depart, rapidly followed by Asuma and all the other Jonin. Well, I don't know about all of you, but I want to see this. I want to see how strong little Naru, Chan has become, Kurinai said. Before Minato flashed them both out of the room and toward the Chunin Stadium, Kashina and Minato paused to take in what they had just heard. Chunin Stadium, Kaden, Goryuka no Jutsu, Sweden, Heidoro Panpu. As the A-ranked techniques battled for supremacy over one another and steam started to pour into the air, a massive explosion of fire and water erupted from Naruto and Hiruzen's mouths and collided with each other. The attack caused the stadium to suddenly become extremely warm. Shortly after calling forth his adamantine staff and spinning it around in his hands, Hiruzen leapt forward from the steam. Even though he felt the full force of the attack, Naruto's shoulder bowed slightly as he watched the staff descend, remove Shigeru's sheath, and stop the powerful weapon in its tracks. Hiruzen anticipated Naruto's attempt at a leg sweep and swiftly sidestepped it. Naruto made more hand signals as soon as he saw Hiruzen in midair. He yelled, Futon, Daidoba, and hurled a powerful gust of wind at Hiruzen, causing him to collide with the ground. But the former Hokage exploded in smoke. Like many others, Naruto thought he was a clone as he started to look around. He not to my right, left, front or behind, no way would he try the air after that attack which leaves one place. Before he slammed his fist to the ground, Chakra whirled around Naruto's right fist, sending a shockwave through the ground that caused the earth around him to explode upward and created cracks along the barrier and walls. Hiruzen was pushed from the ground by the attack to his left, but he vanished in smoke once more. Just as Naruto turned to look, the adamantine staff's powerful blow struck his head, sending him flying across the field and through a tree. Feeling his brain jangle from that one, Naruto shook his head and noticed Hiruzen standing where he had been. He asked, you hanged into a piece of rubble? And Hiruzen nodded, which caused Naruto to laugh, after three years you're still taking me to school. As the stadium began to fill with shinobi and civilians, Hiruzen grinned. Naruto noticed the twins with their classmates, who were watching their brother fight with stars in their eyes. He saw his parents, Kakashi, the elders, and a few clan leaders up in the cage box. Hiruzen nodded enthusiastically as Naruto pulled up his sleeves to show weight seals on his ankles and wrists. Since we have an audience, let's take this up a notch, he said. He cracked his neck and said, Kai, as they broke and he felt much lighter right away. He said, let's go Gigi, and Naruto and Hiruzen leaned back before racing toward one another at a speed that should only be followed by the strongest Jonin, clan leaders, and cage level shinobi. As they attempted to track Naruto and Hiruzen's movements, they heard loud slams and felt shock waves strike the arena. A minute later, they saw Hiruzen and Naruto emerge on top of the wall near the edge of one of the barriers. They watched as Hiruzen slammed his left fist into Naruto's face and Naruto slammed his right fist into Hiruzen's. After taking a step back, they both kicked high, connecting with each other and causing the person below them to fall to the ground. Everyone leaned forward in wonder for the next 10 minutes as they watched the Sandame Hokage and the oldest Yandaimi battle it out, throwing fist after fist, swing after swing, and jutsu after jutsu at each other. His parents could hardly believe what was going on. They were aware that he must have grown stronger, but it was astounding how much. Knowing that she had contributed to the creation of this exquisite shinobi in front of her, Tsunade smiled. The genin, chunin, many janin, and all of the civilians in the stands were all in awe. Eiji and Mito could remain seated because it was the most amazing thing they had ever seen to watch their big brother battle such a strong shinobi. Kashina whispered in wonder, Naru. Chan is incredible, while Makoto stood beside her in a similar state. Both Minato and Tsunade were at a loss for words when Minato reached into his pocket, took out a bingo book, and started searching for Naruto's page. His eyes nearly rolled out of their sockets when he did. He gave it to Kashina, who had Makoto and Tsunade peer over her shoulder. They appeared on the verge of passing out as they read the page in front of them. Name. Naruto Uzumaki Namikaze Age. 18 gender, male. Origin. Konohagakure Shinobi rank. Jonin caliber rank, S. Known alias. Konoha no Tsubasa Akuma, Konoha's blade devil. 
Known clan affiliation. Uzumaki clan known element affinities. Futen, Doden, Sweden. Skill list Taijutsu. 4.5 Ninjutsu. 4.5 Genjutsu. 1. Intelligence. 4.5 Strength. 4.5 Speed. 5 Stamina. 5. Hand Seals. 4 Weapons. Katana made of black metal with a purple guard and black sheath. Katana with a flower shapes guard with a white and green sheath. Physical Description. Stands at 6 feet 3 and weighs 205 pounds. Golden blonde hair and violet eyes. Tanned skin and is known to wear traditional leaf shinobi attire with a red scarf and red cloak with black flames. Special Abilities. Known to have chakra sensor-like abilities. Despite age he has enough chakra for two cages. Known Family. Minato Namikaze, Yandaimi Hokage, Kiroi Senku, Kashina Uzumaki, Benahime. Other Information. Is known to have defeated and killed seven swordsman members Raiga Kurosuke and Kushimaru Kurare as well as Chukichi of Kiri and Gari of Explosion Release. Bounty. 65 million Ryo. Dead or alive stationed by Iwa. 65 million Ryo. Alive stationed by Otto 60 million Ryo. Dead or alive stationed by Kiri. In addition to Kashina, Suenade, and Makoto, many clan heads and elders were also reading the bingo books they had on hand and were starting to realize how strong and capable this young man truly was. Inoichi remarked, he could be a real benefit to this village, while Choza Akamichi and Shikaku Nara nodded in agreement. His strength is truly remarkable. Homura remarked, he would make a fine tool for this village, but he failed to notice Kashina's glare at the tool reference. Both of them kicked each other hard during their aerial battle, sending them both plummeting to the ground. How strong is this Gaki Hiruzen? Even though Hiruzen did not respond, Enma complained to his summoner. He was taking too much pleasure in the fight. With one hand on Shigur and the other on his wrist, Naruto swung down, barely touching the ground before propelling himself back into the air. He slashed down with such force that a strong slash of chakra shot from the blade and toward Hiruzen. Harayu. Ken, he called. Doden. Doria, Heki. Kaden, Kakiryu no Jutsu. A massive boulder of earth formed from the earth to try to block the strike, and a large dragon head made of fire shot over it and towards Naruto from behind as Hiruzen quickly conceded the two Jutsus. While the fire dragon was still moving toward Naruto, Hiruzen used his adamantine staff to strike the slash and destroy it, demonstrating the earth wall's strength but also exposing its weakness. Sweden. Suijin Heki. After taking a deep breath, a huge stream of water erupted from Naruto's mouth and surrounded him like a wall, forming a powerful water shield. When the dragon struck the water wall, the wall was able to accomplish its task because the dragon vanished and only steam remained. Hiruzen showed up beside Naruto as he hit the ground and performed additional hand seals. Doden. Doria, Taiga. Naruto found himself skidding as mud now covered his legs and the ground beneath him abruptly became soft and clumpy. Kaden. Karyu Enden. The dragon fire bullets sped forward with another jutsu, striking Naruto as his body engulfed in flames. As Naruto poofed out of existence, demonstrating that it was only a clone, many people in the arena appeared alarmed and believed it was over. They watched as Naruto dropped out of the sky with his right fist encircled by chakra before they could look for him. Hiruzen used his adamantine staff to block Naruto's powerful strike because he was approaching too quickly for Hiruzen to avoid. When a powerful shockwave struck everything behind Hiruzen and destroyed what was left of one of the walls, it was clear how powerful the force was. In the meantime, Hiruzen saw that his staff had developed a tiny crack. The strength of that strike is demonstrated by the fact that his staff is supposedly indestructible. Naruto exclaimed, Futon, Fukunai, as wind. Shaped Kanai gathered around him and swiftly flew in the direction of Hiruzen. Hiruzen remarked, Kaden, Gukaku no Jutsu, as the fireball consumed the kanai, eradicating them entirely, before Naruto leapt forward, drawing at Shisui as he now held his two swords in his hands. Two swords? Many people assumed that Naruto must have learned that while he was away. To his and everyone else's surprise, Hiruzen held his staffs in his hands as he prepared to receive the blades, but Naruto spun around him instead of aiming at him. He didn't realize his chakra and wind element were building until he was watching Naruto spin around. Hiruzen abruptly realized, it's not meant to strike, it meant to push, but before he could escape, a strong gust of wind picked up and slammed into him, sending him flying through the air as he whirled around uncontrollably. As he watched the wind carry Hiruzen into the air, Naruto exclaimed, Takanami, and Kashina gazed at them with admiration. 
To pick up the wind and slam it into the opponent, use swords and rotation. As everyone else nodded, Kashina praised, it's very creative and effective. Naruto was on the ground when he saw Hiruzen take off and start to descend once more. He leapt, landed on the wall, and let out the Rasengan's well, known swirling sound. Everyone watched as Naruto leapt from the wall toward Hiruzen, shaped the Rasengan into his hand, and slammed it into the old Hokage's stomach. Naruto yelled, Rasengan, as it struck its target and launched Hiruzen straight into the wall. Hiruzen hit the ground with a loud crash and a tiny dust cloud formed. Whoa! The twins and numerous other students anon. Students exclaimed. The shinobi appeared somewhat amazed at how well the young shinobi was handling a former Hokage. Naruto smiled and fell to the ground, but before he could move, Hiruzen's staff suddenly reached out and struck his stomach, pushing him back and slamming him against the wall. Naruto grumbled, that sucked, as he felt the wing fall out of him entirely. Both shinobi were staring down at the arena, and everyone was standing. Hiruzen and Naruto. Chan are battling it out. The arena is nearly destroyed, Kashina remarked, glancing down at her son's landing spot. Well, I'm not really shocked. Since Naruto left to join the Guardians, Sensei has wanted to put him to the test. Tsunade said, I know he has been anticipating this spar for a while. Shikaku Nara said, I don't think we can really call it a spar since the stadium is almost gone, to which many people nodded. As expected, Itachi remarked as Hana, Anko, and Shizuka joined him in the stands after learning about the matchup beforehand. Kuranai said, he was bound to get stronger but to go against a former cage is nothing short of incredible, while Asuma gestured with the other Jonin. Despite the complaints of many Jonin, Shizun stated, it's safe to say that I believe little Naruto has outperformed us all. I think there are only a handful of people that could beat him now and they are all in cage box. They all nodded rapidly as they glanced up at the cage box where Minato, Kashina, Tsunade, and Makoto were standing. As soon as they saw Naruto and Hiruzen emerge from the wall's holes, the commotion abruptly stopped. Both the Hiruzen helmet and the area of clothing struck by the Rasengan were gone. He had several cuts and bruises on his face and arms, a small trickle of blood running down his forehead, and a scorch mark on his stomach. Similar to this, Naruto had cuts and bruises all over his body, but he also had a big gash on the side of his face where he had struck the wall. This gash was bleeding heavily, and the majority of his shirt was gone, exposing his muscular body. While some of the women in the stadium winced at the gash because it appeared to be a nasty one and blood was continuously oozing from it, many of them blushed at his physique. While Hiruzen said, I think you should get that gash seen to Naruto.kun, Naruto shook his head. After that, I will. He spat some blood out of his mouth and said, the enemy would not give me a chance to heal myself if I tried to use the Shosen in a real-life battle. Since the statement was so accurate, many people agreed with it. As Naruto sheathed Shigur and simply had Shisui out, Hiruzen simply nodded to him. The two rushed forward and clashed once more as the Black Blade and the Adamantine Staff collided. Itoryu. Shishito. As Naruto swung his blade down, a single long slash pushed towards Hiruzen, but Hiruzen deflected the blow with his staffs, making it disappear. Before putting his hands in his pouches, Hiruzen swung his staff around his head. Shuriken Cage Bunshin no Jutsu. Suddenly, a hundred shurikens shot into the air and raced in Naruto's direction, knowing there were too many to count. Hiruzen was the professor for a reason, but it was uncommon to find someone who could make clones of ninja weapons in this manner. He slammed his hands on the ground and said, Futon, Danjkanami, as Hiruzen held his hands in front of his face and a powerful gust of wind struck the arena, pushing the kanai away. As he did, Naruto came out and kicked the man, sending him flying into the wall. But as more blood streamed down his face, he landed on the wall and punched Naruto exactly where the gash was, sending a powerful wave of pain through his head and causing him to stagger back. Hiruzen gave him a pitying glance, but Naruto recognized it. In battle you use injuries to your advantage. As the two started a bojutsu and kenjutsu match, Hiruzen nodded. For the next five minutes, as sparks flew between them, those who were Jonin or higher noticed that Naruto's movements had slowed down and that his face had turned a little pale. He was now suffering from the wound on his head. However, they could see from Hiruzen that he had been severely beaten and that, as he grew older, he was also starting to slow down. Shikaku said, Hokage. Sama, we might want to stop them before one of them gets badly hurt or before we lose the stadium completely, and Minato nodded. With concern, Kashina gazed at Naruto, observing the severity of the wound on his head. Tsunade nodded and raised her arm for everyone to see when Minato said the word. 
she yelled, the match is over, as Hiruzen's and Naruto's fists came to a halt inches apart. Since we have no victor or loser this match is a draw. As the announcement was made, the entire stadium fell silent, but to Naruto's surprise, nobody Jirata instead, they cheered and applauded for the incredible match they had just witnessed. He could hear Mito and Eiji saying, Oni, Chan is the best, and Mina sitting with Shizune. When he looked up, he saw Makoto and his mother both shouting praise and clapping enthusiastically for their baby, while Minato was giving him a proud look. He turned to face the Jonin, who gave him a thumbs up for keeping up with his elder and an appreciative nod from Kurunai. Kakashi was too busy reading his Icha Icha to listen to Guy and a miniature version of himself yelling about youth. Naruto let himself drop to the ground, landing on his butt as he took a breather, and he sighed contentedly to himself. He felt like he had an Enko hangover from not getting any sleep because of the terrible throbbing pain in his head. As Enma transformed back into his normal form and rubbed his shoulders, he felt Hiruzen take a seat next to him. Before Enma left for his house, he said, I don't think we have fought like that in nearly two decades, to which Hiruzen promptly agreed. Naruto glanced at his Gigi and relished the rest. He asked, you weren't going all out were you Gigi? And Hiruzen grinned and shrugged. He made reference to his Mokaton when he said, maybe not but we both know you weren't either. About 70% of Hiruzen's strength was being used, and Naruto was doing about the same. Given his greater experience and Naruto's head injury, Hiruzen would have won if the match had continued. Despite this, he was proud of his surrogate grandson because he had developed into a fantastic shinobi and he now knew that Naruto would soon overtake him. Tsunade and Kashina appeared in front of them as they were sitting there conversing. Kashina started fussing over Naruto and telling him how proud she was of him. He blushed a little and those who were still watching laughed as she showered him with mother kisses. Take a look at your two states. While Hiruzen and Naruto merely gave her a corny smile, Tsunade shook her head at them both. After rolling her eyes, she turned to face Kashina. Tsunade said, let's get them to the hospital and get them patched up, and Kashina wholeheartedly agreed. She lifted her son's right arm over her shoulder and assisted him in standing up, and Tsunade did the same with Hiruzen before she quietly left. Later that day, Naruto and Hiruzen sat at Ichiraku's ramen restaurant and savored their meal while both of them were covered in bandages in different places. In an animated conversation, Mito and Eiji asked Naruto and Hiruzen all about their match and whether they could teach them any of their jutsu. Naruto assured Kashina that he was alright while she continued to make sure his bandages were in place. She didn't appear to understand. As Mina sat on his lap and they ate their ramen together in peace, ignoring the obtrusive Kashina and the amazed Mito and Eiji, Minato shook his head at his wife's behavior. Naruto was left to deal with that. Sitting on a low-level roof with his elbows up, Naruto called out, How you doing Mito? Chan, you having fun? While looking down at his sister, who was picking up trash near the Hokage monument. Mito complained, Oni. Chan stopped bothering me, which only made Naruto laugh as he saw her team finish another D-rank mission. While the pale boy Sai quietly went about his work, her teammate Shikamaru was idly throwing some trash into the black bag in his hands. Kashina was reading a magazine next to Naruto while she observed her new team finish their mission. As Shikamaru rolled his eyes, Mito angrily exclaimed, This is stupid. How much longer are we going to be doing these stupid chores? Don't roll your eyes at me lazy ass. He scratched the back of his head and yawned, saying, Then stop complaining. You have done this for every mission for the last three months. But it's insulting to do this and it's embarrassing. Sai stated, You know if you keep complaining it will cause you to get wrinkly so flatty, while grinning eerily at Mito. Mito yelled, Uh. Bastard as she attempted to attack Sai, but Shikamaru intervened to prevent her from murdering their teammate. Come here and say that again. I'll kick your ass. Kashina called out, Mito. Chan, lowering her magazine to gaze at her daughter. This caused Mito to pause and raise her gaze to her mother. These D ranks all help build up your credit and it will get you closer to obtaining the right to going on a C rank mission. Mito complained, but Ka. Chan, but Kashina's abruptly severe expression cut her off. With a frown now fixed on her face, she returned to picking up litter while complaining and kicking the dirt. Kashina gave Naruto a flick on the ear as he observed them with a chuckle. She raised an eyebrow at him and asked, don't you have anything better to do than rile up your little sister? She received a shrug in return. He told her, it's too much fun and she is so easy to tease. Besides, it's the job of the older shinobi to tease the freshies. You probably did the same when you were in my position, as she had a blank expression on her face. 
That was accurate because she recalled making fun of Minato's students Kakashi, Obito, and Rin when they worked as a team. They still had to complete D ranks even though Kakashi graduated much earlier than the other two. She looked down at her son once more, who returned to taunting his younger sister, who was attempting to give him the most terrifying glare she could manage. Don't you have a mission today? She asked. He pointed to the seals on his arms and the scrolls on his hip and said, yeah but it's not for another hour. Besides I already have everything packed. Kashina strayed from the subject and said, well, then, before moving on to something entirely different. She asked, so are there any girls that interest you? As Naruto gave her a startled look, he really didn't want to talk to his mother about that. It was a bit too strange. Where is it heading? Before responding to her, he pondered. You are M no Ka. Chan, no girls right now, I'm happy to just be on my own. Her eyes were burning with a fire that made him shake his head. Oh come on now, there must be someone to catch your attention. I hear Makoto's son is still with that girl from the Natashiko village. I can't let Makoto outdo me again, she said. So that's why. Kashina sighed slightly before nodding in agreement as Naruto said, I'm sorry to disappoint Ka. Chan, but there isn't a girl right now, so you will have to wait a little longer. She frowned and wanted to cause the pain at the thought of some harlot trying to snare her oldest, but she knew she would have to accept it if she ever wanted grandchildren. However, that didn't mean she couldn't assist in choosing and urging him toward a girl she liked. Naruto sensed a familiar figure sit next to him as Kashina gazed down at the genin in front of her. He turned to see Anko sitting there, spinning a kanai in her left hand, and staring down at the new squad. Anko smiled and asked, breaking in the new blood, which only caused him to roll his eyes at his teammate. He spoke loudly enough for his sister to hear, thought I would see how they are doing. They have promised but Mito. Chan is being impatient. Anko laughed as Mito gave him a red, faced glare in return. Anko told her, get used to it Mito because it's not going to change for a while, which caused her to sigh in frustration, just as Kashina had just moments before. He teased, causing Anko to playfully slap his arm. So I thought you had work today? Was there not enough prisoners to keep you happy and contained? He asked. I'm on my break and I thought I would come see you before I see Hannah. Chan. I won't get to see my two favorite people for a couple of days, she said with a sigh. Seeing the secret message in his friend's eyes, he said, but I feel there is another reason that you wanted to speak with me. Anko leaned closer to him and nodded. Make sure my girl comes back safe and sound. I don't like it when you she goes on missions without me. You know Hannah is more than capable of looking after herself Anko. Chan. She is a Jonin after all. I know and I am not saying she is weak by any means. But she is not like you, Itachi and I she is not quite at the level we are at and I don't want her to get to over her head. You know she can be a little prideful. Hell I know she can be prideful. In the bedroom it's always a wrestle to see who comes out on top and who gets to be submissive and who gets to be dominant. Naruto gestured with his hand. Before putting his arm around his longtime friend to reassure her, he muttered, too much information, but I see where you coming from. Anko would normally have been okay with Hannah going on a mission, but he surmised that she was a little nervous because they were traveling to Kiri, where a civil war had just ended. He held out his pinky finger in front of him and said, I promise to make sure your girl returns home safely, it's on my way of the shinobi. After comprehending the gesture, Anko put her pinky around his. She then showed her softer side to one of her true friends by leaning in and kissing him on the cheek. Thank you, anytime Anko. Chan. I don't make promises I can't keep. Kashina occasionally leaned in to try to hear what the two lifelong friends were saying as they chatted for five minutes. The training schedule for their spars were Itachi, Hana, Hayate, and Yugo was the only topic of conversation between the two. Twenty minutes after Anko left to visit Hana, Naruto departed as well, bidding farewell to his mother and sister before making his way to the south gate to meet with his team. After four days other small boats were docking and departing with their various trade goods when Naruto leapt from the edge of a wooden boat and landed on a tiny wooden harbor. He surveyed his surroundings and scowled a little because the small harbor town was currently covered in a great deal of mist. He was aware that they would be completely blind without his sensor abilities. Before he gestured for his two partners behind him to follow him, he thought, even though I don't sense anyone harmful at the moment, we get moving while we can. With their teammate Hayate at her side. Hannah swiftly followed, her three Ninkan walking closely beside her and always on guard. As a shinobi, Hayate had really stepped up and demonstrated that he could fight just as well as everyone else in his age group. Despite the fact that he was still sickly and likely always would be, 
he swiftly rose to prominence in his generation and became a role model for many other sickly kids. Hayate was proficient in Kenjutsu and had a knack for Taijutsu and Firejutsu, though he was not quite as strong as his friend with the blonde hair. He became both a formidable ally and a troublesome foe as a result. The village hidden in the mist is said to be about five hours room this dock site and we will have to cross a lake on foot to get there, Naruto said as he continued forward. If we get there before mid-afternoon then we should be able to avoid needing to stay in the area for too long. Right, that's probably for the best. They may still be antsy with the civil war only just having ended, Hannah said. Remember this is simply a delivery mission. We give the given message scroll to the new Mizukage, wait for the response and then we leave. We will be in and out of the village within an hour. Hayate thought it would be simpler to ask, could this not be something the Hokage could not just send by Hawk? But he saw Naruto shake his head quickly. Normally it would be but seeing as my father has three of his Jonin delivering it personally, we can only assume that whatever message it contains is of great importance. After his two friends nodded, the three of them looked around to make sure they had everything they needed before launching themselves into the surrounding trees and swiftly moving along the tops of the branches. Hannah sat in the center, Hayate covered them from behind, and Naruto sat in the front. On their way to the village hidden in the mist, they remained in that formation for two hours. As they made their way to their destination, Naruto was taken aback by how accurate that name was. There was so much mist that it was difficult to see what was in front of you. Before the mist would descend, you would have only two or three meters of unobstructed vision. It was occasionally even lower. I can't let my guard down for even a second. An ambush or any kind could be waiting for us at any moment. I'm starting to think sending a hawk might have been the better choice. Both Hayate and Hana stopped as soon as they thought they were at least two-thirds of the way to the village. Naruto stopped in his tracks and scanned their surroundings with a focused expression on his face. Before noticing that Hana and her Ninkin were sniffing the air and growling, Hayate questioned, what is it? Whatever it was that they had smelled was causing them to prepare. The Ninkin were positioned left, right, and center by Hana, their jaws snapping at the air as the three swiftly repositioned themselves behind him. Hayate, Hana, Manji formation, he called. How many? Naruto felt six people surrounding them as he looked around. As far as he could tell, they were all positioned at different heights and points. Six at least. Be careful. They have the home field advantage here and they know how to use the mist. No action unless given cause to. Something whirling through the air could be heard approaching them as he finished speaking. Naruto pulled Shisui from his back and swung a huge demon shuriken directly at him before Hana and Hayate could respond. The shuriken's fragmented pieces broke in two and lodged themselves in a nearby tree. Hayate exclaimed, whoa, at how fast his friends responded before they heard brisk footsteps approaching. Attack. When they looked up, a shinobi with a blade drawn dropped directly in the middle of them while wearing a mask resembling Anbu. I got him, declared Hayate after he struggled with the shinobi and pushed him away after drawing his blade. Naruto's gaze shifted in front of him, sensing three individuals approaching him while two others were moving toward Hana. Before slamming his hands to the floor and performing his own jutsu, he heard the words, Sweden, Sweden no jutsu. He called, Doden, Doria, Heki, as a huge wall erupted in front of him. He called, Hana too coming for you from your left, and Hana nodded, spotting them right away with her keen sense of smell. As she went down onto all four with her ninkin stationed with her, her nails became more feral and her eyes more canine, like. As Naruto confronted the three hunter, like shinobi who leapt over the earth, made wall, she muttered, fang over fang, and then lunged through the air. The attack caused Hana to spin around in midair with her ninkin, giving the impression that a horizontal tornado was tearing through the atmosphere. She approached the two shinobi who were attacking and struck one of them, killing his heart and lungs in the process. The other shinobi sidestepped out of her way and pulled out a sword. After landing, Hana stood up and clutched a kanai firmly. Above them, Hayate was fighting off earlier attacking Kiri Ninja, holding his own and gaining ground on his adversary. Cough. Uh. Who area? Cough. Are you? He asked, but the shinobi refused to respond and kept attacking. When the metal touched, sparks flew from their swords. After avoiding a quick blow from the shinobi, Hayate raised his blade to deflect another blow. Hayate kept dodging and could tell by his opponent's movements that he was growing increasingly irritated at his inability to hit his opponent. His swings were becoming slower and his movements more sloppy. Hayate asked, are you with Kiri or the new Godem Mizukage? But all he received in return were angry blows. Kaga so be it. In the meantime, 
Naruto scowled at two of the adversary shinobi, each of whom was holding a sword. At the moment, the third was trapped in Naruto's right arm in a headlock. He attempted to rush, breaking both arms. His opponent was instantly rendered helpless by a powerful blow to the stomach, and then he snapped their neck with tremendous force. He pulled out Shigur as well and held both blades in front of him, since I'm trying to get to Kiri quickly I'm going to make this quick. I really don't have the time of the patience to have to deal with you right now, he said. Then he saw the two Anbu doubts team up with him and take off. He watched as his opponents attempted to push him back while his swords clashed with them. Their other hands raised to swing at Naruto, but he effortlessly sidestepped them while wearing a bored expression. He slammed his foot into the ground and said, have to do better than that, as his foot glowed green. When a mini earthquake struck, the ground cracked and everyone, especially the two Anbu he was fighting, stumbled in shock. Where Naruto had slammed his foot, a massive crater that was about six inches wide and cracked all over the ground started to form. He took advantage of the situation by lifting Shigur into the air. He also leapt into the air and cut down on the startled Anbu. Harayu. Can. The Anbu member exploded into flames as he choked out blood from beneath his mask while he slashed his opponent and watched them fall back as the attack supposedly caused damage. As he pushed forward, he heard the other Anbu yell, Bastard, as a water dragon sprang forward, its big red eyes staring at Naruto with intense intensity. With his eyes narrowed, Naruto took Shigur and Shisui in his hands and held them aside while closing his eyes. Yakodori. He muttered as he simultaneously swung both of his swords, causing a huge slash of compressed air to form from the slashed. The air was so dense that it formed a crescent moon. Shaped object that swiftly sailed towards the attack. The water dragon split in half the instant it connected, scattering to Naruto's sides, avoiding him by a narrow margin and destroying the few trees behind him. Then, while the Anbu was in the middle of making hand signals, Naruto leapt off the ground and materialized in front of him. He was, at least, until Naruto abruptly cut off his hands, sending them flying in the opposite direction. Naruto raised his right foot and kicked the Anbu high into the air before he could even utter a word, breaking his jaw in the process. Naruto leapt high into the air and returned to facing the Anbu, who was staring at him in excruciating pain, after pumping chakra into his legs. Naruto said to the Anbu, Checkmate, before he used a strong super strength kick and a chakra boost into his right leg. The man's head struck the kick, sending it hurtling through the air and into the mist. Filled valley as his body fell to the ground, dead. After performing a backflip, Naruto collapsed to the ground, landing on a tree branch before he walked idly down the tree and put Shigur and Shisui back in their sheaths and sealed them in his arms. Dusting off his jacket, he gazed up into the air, watching Hayate flip through the air, still fighting his opponent, while to his left, he witnessed Hana hit her opponent with a second fang over fang. The Anbu was thrown through the air by the attack and struck a tree with great force. Naruto nodded and whistled before noticing two more signs surrounding them. One felt curious and calmer than the others, while the other Anbu felt hostile. But the adversary he sensed materialized behind Hana. Naruto noticed a faint human shape emerge from the mist and a glint of metal. As she checked her opponent's pulse, Hana was unaware of it, and Naruto pushed forward, determined to fulfill his pledge to Anko. When Hana felt that the Anbu was definitely dead, she sighed and knelt down to check his pulse. She wasn't even sure what happened because it happened so fast. The familiar shapes of shurikens and kanai were hurled rapidly in her direction as soon as she turned around. She wanted to move, but she and the triplets, who were all breathing heavily, were exhausted from using multiple fangs over one another. While the triplets attempted, but failed, to move her aside by tugging on her butts, she did what she could and raised her arms to defend herself. She saw the back of Naruto's head materialize in front of her before they could strike, though, and saw him catch the shuriken in midair before hurling them back at the hidden enemy at an even greater speed. He sent the kanai into the trees after blocking them with his sword Shigur. As he turned around and saw Hannah's stunned expression, he asked, You alright Hannah? Chan? And watched her nod her head while taking deep breaths. She said, I'm okay. Thank you Naruto.kun, and Naruto gave her a nod. The fact that she froze in that manner and allowed someone to get the drop on her made her feel bad about herself. She should have sensed his approach, but she and the triplets let their guard down because she was so focused on ensuring her opponent was dead. His words, try and keep your senses open at all times, Hannah. Chan. I would hate to have to have to tell Anko. Chan that something happened to you, caused her to nod in an unhappy manner, but that soon changed when she saw that Naruto had a kanai embedded in his left shoulder. She said softly, hold still, 
As she approached him closely and removed the kanai from his shoulder, she watched as his hand was raised to tend to the wound, but when she put her own on there first, he stopped. Naruto could feel the wound slowly starting to heal as her hands glowed green. It's the least I can do. Just because I can heal animals doesn't mean I don't have some skill in healing people too. Tsunade. Sama was nice enough to show me a few tricks. With a few minor cuts on his body, Hayate was sheathing his sword away when Naruto turned his head and nodded. However, Naruto noticed the man he had previously felt behind him, and now that he was staring at him, he had to confess that he looked and felt oddly familiar. His hair stood up with tags pierced on each ear, and his face was hidden behind a familiar mask of navy blue. Before the man approached and stopped directly in front of him, he stood staring at him. Given that this man was a rogue like the other shinobi they had just encountered, Naruto tensed his body and asked, are you friend or foe? Hana and Hayate were standing right behind Naruto, watching the man in front of them intently. He saw Naruto nod his head in response to his question, are you the leaf shinobi that the Hokage sent to meet with the new Godem Mizukage? Yes we are? So you're a friend then? After nodding, the Anbu took off his mask to reveal a man in his late thirties with his right eye covered by an eye patch. My name is Ao, Anbu captain of Kiri and right hand man of the new Mizukage, he informed them. I was told by Mizukage. Sama to meet you before you got to the village but I see you encountered problems. Naruto felt behind the eye patch as he examined the man. A Byakugan. After making that discovery, he recalled the last time he had seen this man. He was the Anbu to whom Naruto gave the twin swords on the day he battled Raiga Kurosuki, provided that she kept Raiga's body. Naruto looked around at the bodies and said, yes you could say something like that. He then instructed Hana and Hayate to stack the bodies and set them on fire. Who are they? They are remnants of the Yandaimi Mizuka Jigura's forces. Despite Yagura being dead he still has troops loyal to him and believing in his cause to wipe out those with bloodlines. There is team out looking for these people as we speak but I will have to send a messenger hawk ordering them back. They watched as Hayate used a fire jutsu to set the bodies on fire after Naruto nodded. Before he took off through the trees, he said, come, I'll show you the rest of the way to Kiri. These paths can be dangerous, as I'm sure you kids have already realized. Try to keep up otherwise you might take a nasty fall. The three gave the older shinobi a raised eyebrow before following him through the trees. The veteran shinobi led the way and led them the safest route to Kiri, so the trip with Ao leading them took roughly half as long. The water ran the remaining distance towards Kiri after reaching the end of the island they were on, and finally they discovered the village buried in the mist. Since this was their first visit to the mist village, they concluded right away that it was unquestionably one of the more naturally protected by the surrounding environment and that it was worthy of the moniker, hidden in the mist. Even though it was large, they could hardly see it, and the name was well. Deserved. The visibility improved as they approached, but the cold and the fog made it seem as though they were entering a different planet. The mist appeared to clear as one entered the gates, making the building and its occupants more visible. While shinobi patrolled the roofs, men, women, and children went about their daily lives in the village. Ao said, taking the leaf shinobi to see the mizukage, to the two gate guards who gave the man a languid nod. This village had their own versions of Azumo and Katetsu, Naruto had to surmise. Ao grumbled as they made their way through the village, damn upstarts. The three of them were taken aback by how familiar the leaf village looked. The civilians wore similar clothes, albeit thicker ones because of the cold, and the building designs were very familiar. From the rooftops, they could see a few shinobi watching them, clearly keeping watch. Since the leaf village would most likely act similarly when guests from other villages visited their homes, Naruto couldn't hold them responsible. Naruto noticed that many of the buildings were damaged and undergoing reconstruction, and there were also new construction sites scattered throughout the area. Many were constructed from large rock. Like materials and stone. It appeared to him that apartment complexes were being constructed for their shinobi. Six months after the end of the civil war, they were still rebuilding and regaining their strength. Kiri was able to bring in the shinobi and civilians who had fled the village at the beginning of the civil war as well as establish a new government and council with the new Mizukage, whoever they were. They knew they had reached the Mizukage residence when, after a 15-minute walk, they came to a large building that resembled the Hokage building. Ao nodded to the guards as he entered, led them up a set of stairs, and halted at the third floor. As they walked into a reception office and noticed a blue-haired teenager carrying a big, bandaged sword leaving the Mizukage's office, Ao inquired, Chojiro is Mizukage. Sama in. They estimated that he was at least a year younger than them or at least their own age. When Ao started talking to him, 
he appeared a little apprehensive and bashful, and when he left the office, his face appeared to be flushed. He looked nervously at the three, who waved at him in an attempt to be friendly and courteous. H. Hi Al. Senpei. Are these the leaf shinobi? He asked. He said, they are Chojiro, and then he addressed the younger shinobi gravely. Chojiro I need you to go the messenger hawk pay and send out a message to squad 5. Tell them the group they are tracking have already been found and dealt with and they are to return home. Chojiro turned to face them, focusing on Naruto before he gave a startled yelp in return. They were shocked when he said, the Yandaimi Hokage's son, but Ao quickly returned his focus by glaring at him. After saying, hi senpei, I'll get right on it, he quickly left the room, trembling as he passed Naruto. Naruto raised an eyebrow and said, what was that all about, before Ao snorted. Ao further perplexed them by asking, why do you think, did you not see the giant sword on his back? Before knocking on the door in front of them and nodding to the receptionist behind the desk. As Ao pushed the door open and motioned for Naruto, Hana, and Hayate to enter, they all heard a gentle voice telling them to do so. Stepping, both Hayate and Naruto realized what was causing Chojiro's appearance to turn so red and flushed. Without a doubt, one of the most attractive women either of them had ever seen was the Mizukage working behind a desk. She had a slim figure, green eyes, and auburn hair that was ankle length, tied in a top knot with a dark blue band, and adorned with four bangs at the front and a herringbone pattern at the back. She has two long bangs that cross each other on her bust, just below her chin, and two short bangs, one of which covers her right eye. She was wearing a blue shirt with long sleeves that exposed her shoulders and the very top of her breasts. She is dressed in leggings and mesh armor underneath, with a dark pair of shorts covering her upper body. Despite Naruto's best efforts, he was unable to conceal his blush. Hayate appeared to be about to pass out and didn't even try to hide it. She even made Hana look a little hot and bothered. Naruto felt as though he knew her from somewhere, even though he blushed when he looked at her. She reminded him of someone he knew, and he found it fascinating. She said in a smooth voice, Thank you, Ao. Ao nodded, sat down behind her, and leaned against the wall. Then she smiled courteously as she turned to face them. Despite appearances, this woman had a purpose for being the Mizukage and was aware that they needed to be vigilant. As the three of them bowed to her, I said, My name is Mei Terumi the Godem Mizukage of Kirigakir. I hope you all traveled safely to our village. I would hate if the leaf found out that any of you were hurt in any way. I formally welcome you to our lovely village. Naruto.san, in particular. The fact that the Hokage sent his oldest to visit me surprises me. So you're aware of who I am? He inquired as she gestured for him to sit down, and the Mizukage laughed behind her desk as Hana and Hayate stood up behind him. She said to him, Naruto.san, you will discover that in Kiri you have become somewhat of a legend here. You have fought and killed two of Kiri's seven swordsmen in the last five years. One was a shinobi of high a class, and the other was of low a class. I'm sure that when you entered through the gates, many of our shinobi were anxious and tense. Before he understood what Al meant by Chojiro, he nodded, and he assumed the young man he had met was a seven-dot swordsman.in. Training, though he wasn't sure which sword he was holding. Is that the reason Kiri still has a bounty on my head, alive or dead? He inquired and Mei simply kept grinning at him. She said sweetly, I might have forgotten to get rid of that. Yagura's paranoia was the main cause of that. The thought of young people like you gaining so much power at such a young age bothered him. He nodded, but he wasn't sure if he believed her, assuming that this lovely and seductive mask she had made was a cover for her shinobi side. Even though that may seem accurate, we won't have any issues here, will we? With his hand resting on the seal that Shisui was sealed in, Naruto said, I don't feel like losing my head anytime soon. Mei simply kept grinning at him. Mei was aware that Ao was tensing up and getting ready behind her, but she waved him away, indicating that Naruto could do the same for Hana and Hayate, who were also getting ready and on guard. Mei. Sama, I'm happy that we can understand one another. Would it be okay if I called you Mei? Sama? Mei shook her head in response to his statement. Absolutely not, Naruto.san. As he nodded, she said, I've never been one for honorifics. Ao rolled his eyes, believing that his Mizukage shouldn't be behaving so casually around the foreigners. I'm glad to hear that. A tiny pop and a little smoke were heard before Naruto revealed a scroll in his hands. Well, in any case, we should just get this over with, he said, placing his left over his right wrist and channeling chakra into a small storage scroll. He told the Mizukage solemnly, this is from our Yandaimi Hokage for your eyes and your eyes only, as he gave the scroll to him. 
May accepted it with ease, and everyone saw her adopt a more solemn expression as she unfolded the scroll and gradually started reading it. As they waited for the lovely Mizukage to respond, the team of Leaf Shinobi sat quietly in the office. Ao was attempting to peer over Mei's shoulder, and Naruto even suspected that he was tempted to use his Baikugan to read what it said. However, Mei's one glance caused him to turn pale and turn away. Naruto, Hana, and Hayate watched five minutes later as Mei completed writing a reply to the Hokage in a scroll that looked similar, sealed it, and gave it to Naruto. I'm responding to the Hokage like this. To put it briefly, you could say, I accept the proposal, but give him the scroll for a more thorough response. As he sealed it away into his wrist, Naruto narrowed his eyes as his previous thoughts about her returned, and he nodded while observing Mei lean back in her chair and stare at him. The skin tone and the shape of her face bothered him, it was on the edge of his tongue, but it kept eluding him. Why does she look so familiar? He asked himself as he examined her. The hair and the jade green eyes were completely new on him. As Naruto was jolted out of his reverie, Ao said roughly, Namikaze Dotsan, I ask that you stop staring at the Mizukage. Mei was grinning slightly, mentally applauding that, at 30.6, she could still entice young men with her beauty and charms. He said, oblivious to Mei's hair abruptly falling in front of her eyes, casting a shadow over them, her generosity of being partners with the leaf will only go so far so don't get any ideas. She thought glumly, partners? As in a wife and husband? Before turning back to face Ao. Her voice was bittersweet, making Ao look like he had just been kicked in the crotch and giving him a blanket of fear. Shut up Aua. Or I'll kill you, she said. Scary, everyone thought, but Naruto's eyes widened as he realized who this woman was reminding him of, and no one else could see it. Before deciding to put it out of his mind for the time being, he thought, the hair and eyes might be different, but some of the mannerisms and the way she speaks are the same with her. If I have her grow her hair out like May, Sans, then they would almost match. In an attempt to adhere to the plan of not remaining in the village for more than an hour, Naruto said, if that will be all that perhaps at time we left, as he got to his feet. Of course Naruto.san, Mei replied as she got to her feet, but before she could do so, there was a knock on the window, and everyone turned to see a Konoha messenger hawk standing there. She opened the window, took out the small message the bird was carrying, and then offered it to Naruto, looking surprised and bewildered. It's addressed to you, she said, startling Naruto and the other leaf shinobi. He took the message, opened it, and skimmed through the information his father had laid out. Everyone watched as a bewildered expression changed from one of anger to one of smiles as he nodded his head. Mei. Sama, do you have some paper and a pen I could use? Mei nodded and gave him some paper and ink from her drawing as he asked. He quickly wrote a reply to the message, turned around to face Hana and Hayate, and sent the hawk back to Konoha. It appears that Kakashi encountered some difficulties in Wave Country with his genin team. Hana and Hayate were about to leave when they noticed Naruto standing still and turned to face Mei. We've been instructed to go help them, he said, and they both nodded quickly. He handed the note to a startled, looking Mei Terumi, who started reading it. My father wrote in the note that this could be a good chance to test out the possible alliance between Kiri and Konoha. After a brief moment, she had a look of surprise and realization before turning to face Naruto and grinning broadly. Yes, Naruto.san, she said. I think this will work out perfectly, and they all smiled at each other, leaving the other people in the room to wonder what they were discussing. After a short while just outside of Mizukage Tower, Naruto stood in an alleyway, biting his thumb and reciting some well-known hand signals before exclaiming, Kachiyose no Jutsu. In a cloud of smoke, a tiny white tiger cub with vivid green eyes materialized. It purred as soon as it saw Naruto. Naruto, sending another message to he put a scroll in the cub's mouth and said, Shish, Gaia, I still haven't told anyone about that yet, but yes I am. The cub vanished once more, leaving a grinning Naruto in her wake. As Hana and Hayate stood to his left and right, Naruto knocked on the wooden door of a charming little three-bedroom house. Between Hana and himself, the triplets were positioned, sniffing the area to ensure there were no enemy signatures nearby that could cause issues. It only took them roughly two days to get to the merchant country because wave country and water country were not that far apart. Since wave country had its own natural defenses, they didn't have any shinobi of their own. Many minor nations and a few major nations conducted business with the country, which was a straightforward trading nation. Since wave country was generally a very quiet and serene place, they rarely received requests from them. Naruto heard a few voices abruptly stop and become silent from behind the wooden door. Then, 
faint footsteps approached the door and came to a stop as the door slid open. A stunning woman with dark hair who appeared to be in her early 30s was standing in front of him, she was wearing a dark blue skirt and a pink blouse. An elderly man in his 60s was seated at a small table behind her, holding a glass of sake. She asked courteously, may I help you, while glancing at the newcomers and recognizing them from the headbands they had been given. Naruto saw the memory flash into her eyes before she nodded. Hello miss. My name is Naruto, and these are my teammates Hana and Hayate. We're from Konoha and were told to arrive at this location by our Hokage after receiving a requiring backup letter from Kakashi Hitaki, Naruto said. She stepped aside to greet them and gave them permission to enter their house. Please come in, she said. According to what he had seen of the town thus far, the house was definitely one of the nicer. Looking ones and was cozy and comfortable. It demonstrated that the region had experienced severe hardship. Naruto noticed Eiji reading one of the books their father had given him about Fuinjutsu while seated by the small table as soon as they entered the tiny dining area. When Eiji heard their footsteps, he looked up and saw his older brother enter the room, which made his face ten times brighter. He hurriedly stood up and gave his older brother a firm embrace, which Naruto returned. He heard Eiji whisper, I'm glad you're here, while Naruto gave him a shoulder pat. Even though Eiji would not freely acknowledge it, the appearance of one of the seven ninja swordsmen had greatly alarmed him. He had been terrified of Zabuza. The man could compete with Kakashi of all people, and he was the epitome of danger. The only reason they were still alive was because he and Sasuke were fortunate enough to rescue Kakashi after he was apprehended. Sakura and Sasuke, the other two team members, were also seated around the table. Sakura was gazing adoringly at Sasuke, while Sasuke had a brooding expression on his face as he gazed out the window. As Naruto placed his arm over his younger brother's shoulder, the only thought that crossed the minds of Hana, Hayate, and Naruto was, fangirl. Eiji gave him a negative shake of his head as he asked, are you okay? It scared me a little to hear my little brother encountered Zabuza Momochi of all people. Are you hurt anywhere? I'm okay but Kakashi Sensei is upstairs in bed. He overused his Sharingan in the fight and has been bedridden for the last two days. He listened to Eiji explain what had transpired when they left Konoha for their alleged C rank mission for the next 10 minutes. The Demon Brothers, two notorious thugs from Zabuza, attacked them just three hours after they had left. For a couple of genin, it was more than enough that they were only C rank criminals in the bingo books. Before Kakashi showed up and removed them after noticing who they were pursuing, Eiji and Sasuke had been able to keep the client safe. Naruto couldn't blame his brother and his team for wanting to finish the mission even though he had wished Kakashi had brought them back to the village. However, Kakashi ought to have realized that Zabuza or someone similar must have been waiting. Three days later, they arrived on the shores of Wave Country, where Zabuza greeted them and started fighting Kakashi right away. According to what Eiji told him, it was intense before Kakashi got caught in a trap and was later released thanks to Sasuke and Eiji's combined teamwork. Naruto wanted to scold Eiji, but he knew that if the circumstances had been different, he would have done something similar. He simply gave him a shoulder pat, and Eiji smiled broadly. Even Sasuke's mouth twitched upwards for a brief moment as he swore. After another battle, Kakashi finally used his own move to defeat Zabuza. However, before he could deliver a last blow, a masked Nina apparently Akiri Hunter Nina arrived, removed him, and took the body with him. When Naruto turned to face Hana and Hayate, he saw that they both recognized the unreliability of what they had just heard. Given their recent arrival, he was aware that no Kiri Hunter Nins were currently searching for Zabuza. The Mizukage had previously informed them that all of their Hunter Nins were still in Kiri, assisting in the training of the upcoming generation of Hunter Nins, and that this was the first time they had heard anything about Zabuza in more than a year. Hana reassured them that was no Hunter Nin, while giving one of her three dogs a head pat. Sakura and Eiji Sasuke looked in her direction. We just came from Kiri in a meeting with the Mizukage. She has no Hunter Nins currently searching for Zabuza. Sakura gasped, and they heard it, but then who was that person with the mask? Most likely a Kaga, someone working with Zabuza, replied Hayate. He has been gone a long time, it's not surprising Zabuza may have found some new additions to his little group. After Eiji informed them that he had been struck twice in the neck with Senban needles, Hana questioned, Eiji.kun, where did the hunter Nin hit him exactly? Where on the body? This was what Hana feared, he was put in a death-like state, make the heartbeat so shallow that it masks the shinobi still being alive. Zabuza is very much alive and still out there. Eiji, Sakura, and Sasuke appeared somewhat alarmed at the thought of Zabuza's survival, as Naruto ran a hand through his hair. 
He couldn't blame them because he had made a lasting impression on the three of them. They encountered one of the seven swordsmen of the mist on their first expedition outside the village. We will need to speak to Kakashi about this, but first we need to focus on these three. No doubt they will be in the firing range since Zabuza and his accomplices will want them gone. Zabuza strikes me as a prideful person. Hannah gave her chin a tap. Although her knowledge of medical ninjutsu was limited, it was sufficient to qualify her as a novice. Fortunately, her time spent with Enko gave her a better understanding of the human body and the effects that certain conditions can have on it. Zabuza is not dead but he will need time to heal. He will be bedridden for at least 10 days until he is back at full strength. Two days have passed since the battle so that gives us eight days until he would likely attack again. Naruto muttered, which means we have eight days to whip these guys into shape, before returning his focus to Eiji and his group. Inwardly, he was not shocked when Eiji shook his head in response to his question, have you and your team done much training since you arrived? The other two members of Team 7 then followed suit. After pinching his nose, Naruto sighed deeply and turned to face Eiji and his group. Okay then tell me what Kakashi has been doing with you so far in terms of training, how far have you gotten? Eiji nervously scratched the back of his head, clearly sending a bad message to the newly arrived trio of Jonin. Kakashi. Sensei has been teaching us teamwork skills and had us work on the tree climbing exercises so far, Sakura informed them. They waited for her to finish, but soon discovered she was done. They stared at them in shock, all three of them, he asked, that's it? That's all he has taught you in a month? And received three nods? That's ridiculous, said Hannah, who appeared unimpressed and irate at the seasoned Jonin in charge of these three genin. That is something you should have done in your first week. Why is that all you have learnt? Kakashi sensei is always three hours late, Sakura informed them while fidgeting with her thumbs on her lap. We do an hour of teamwork exercises and then we go to D-rank missions. After that he tells us to go home. Hayate shuffled away from Naruto and Hana, who both felt like ripping out their hair. Both of them mumbled, good for nothing scarecrow, before Naruto removed an empty scroll from one of the seals on his arm and placed it on the table. Then he took out an ink and brush. The 313. Year. Old stared at him as he said, okay, I'm going to be straight with you three. Right now you are way behind where you should be. Eiji and Sasuke might be ahead given their clan training but you Sakura aren't where you should be. Sakura nodded, looking down with self. Disappointment. Despite being the smartest person in the group, she was aware that she was the weakest. But the three of you should be further along and it was Kakashi's job to ensure you got the right training. Obviously he has not done that which means for the next eight days you three will be working your asses off. Understand? He said and observed them all smile. Sakura had a determined expression on her face, Sasuke had a small smile, and Eiji appeared content. As she prepared to assist Naruto with their training regimen, Hana inquired, have all three of you completed the tree walking exercise? The three Jonin were relieved when they all nodded their heads. Naruto informed them, then we can start on the next exercise. Hayate every morning I want you to teach them the water walking exercise. That will improve their chakra control and their reserves. You three will do that every morning until you can do the exercise without even thinking about it. Sasuke appeared a little annoyed that he had to listen to his brother's friends, but the three of them nodded. In the afternoon we will focus on your individual skills and raise them up. If I think it's possible, we might even show teach you guys a new jutsu or two, understand? Tazuna and Tsunami, who had just watched and listened for the past half hour, were impressed by how rapidly Naruto had taken control, and the three genin nodded their heads. Tazuna got to his feet, ready to head out to the bridge and carry on building it. Since it's still morning you three will go out with Hayate and begin the water walking exercise. Hayate don't let them come back until they can stand on the water for at least 30 seconds. Hayate replied, Willa. Kaga. Do, and got up, gesturing for the genin to follow him. Although Sasuke glared at Naruto for a short while, he soon started moving after Naruto gave him a look telling him to do so. The three of them left each looking eager, focused, and clearly happy that they were receiving some actual training. In terms of the genin, there were advantages to being a janin. Naruto created two shadow clones as they were leaving. He told Tazuna, Tazuna.san. These clones will go with you to the bridge and keep guard for you. I promise nothing will get past them, and Tazuna nodded thank you as he departed after bidding his daughter farewell. After everyone had departed, Hana slammed a hand down on the table and gave Naruto an angry look. What the hell was Kakashi thinking? What was the Hokage thinking? They should have been sent straight back to the village the moment they ran into the demon brothers. How could Kakashi be so foolish? Naruto said to her, 
let's go and find out, and the two of them got up and ascended the stairs, Hannah trailing closely behind Naruto. Hannah was enraged beyond belief. Even though she and Kiba may not agree at the moment, she still cares for him. She would have been furious and would have demanded Kakashi's head if she had learned that her younger brother had encountered a shinobi of Zabuza Momochi's level. She had known Naruto long enough to recognize his anger, she could tell from the expression in his eye that Kakashi was somewhat enraged with his father. After 20 minutes, a drowsy and worn dot out Kakashi awoke with a dream about gorgeous bikini. Clad girls in a big hot tub. With a moan, he attempted to sit up, but instead he felt a burden on his chest. He looked up, blinking the sleepers from his eyes, and saw Hannah's three ninkan snarling at him with their paws on his chest. When he saw Naruto and Hannah sitting with their backs to the wall and their arms crossed, he swallowed before his face turned pale. Both had squinted, and he thought he heard Naruto crack his knuckles. Kakashi said hesitantly, so I'm guessing you're the backup? Before Hannah slammed the door shut and he saw Naruto activate silencing seals throughout the room, neither of them responded. Hayate observed from outside as Sakura, Sasuke, and Eiji kept falling into the freezing water, making it clear what was going on inside. Watching the genin drop like suckers into the water was too much fun for him. Unaware of the reprimands and beating their sensei was receiving, the three trembled in their damp clothing. The following day standing off to the side, Naruto observed Eiji, Sakura, and Sasuke running laps around the makeshift training field he and Hana had constructed for the three genin, each of whom had a slightly different appearance. At the moment, Kakashi was moving around because of the Shosen Jutsu, and Hayate was protecting the bridge builder. With just a little perspiration on his brow, Eiji appeared to be in reasonably good shape due to his Uzumaki endurance. Sasuke was able to keep up with his blonde teammate despite falling a few paces behind him and appearing a little more breathless. Sakura, who had already been lapped twice by the two boys and appeared on the verge of passing out, was now following closely behind. In the hopes that their strength and abilities would be enhanced enough to assist with the impending threat of Zabuza, they had been observing the three genin since yesterday and devised a well known training routine that each would follow daily. Eiji Naruto was sufficiently aware because his skill set and maneuvers mirrored those of their father, who favored taijutsu and his try. Prong Kanai in battle and depended more on speed than strength. His close .to mid range fighting style was similar to Mito's. He applied weight seals to Eiji's arms and legs and made him concentrate on his speed. He made him spar with one of his shadow clones. Sasuke was a little different because he was more of a ninjutsu fighter and could switch between close, up and long, range combat thanks to his mastery of taijutsu and fire jutsu. In order to find out what fire jutsu he was familiar with, Naruto had him practice two kaiden jutsu techniques. During the mission, he promised to give Sasuke another kaiden jutsu every time he mastered one. Sasuke attempted to push his luck, but Naruto swiftly corrected him by shoving him to the ground and twisting his arm behind him reminding him of his superior. However, Sakura had the worst physical skills by far. The girl was undoubtedly intelligent, and her impressive chakra control was a result of her extremely small reserves. She had told them she was on a diet to maintain her figure because she would get tired too easily. Hana was furious, and Naruto had a serious face palm. She assured him that she would personally train the girl and handle Sakura. If Hana had inherited anything from her girlfriend, it was a strong dislike of fangirls. Hannah yelled at Sakura, keep moving pinky or I'm setting the triplets on your ass, after the girl with the pink hair had paused to catch her breath. When the triplets growled at her, Sakura quickly started running again after turning to face them. After giving a frustrated sigh, Hannah turned to face Naruto, who was beaming at her. What are you grinning at Blondie? He saw her blush like a tomato before swatting his arm. Who knew my lovely Anko? Chan would have such an effect on you. Tell me when's the wedding? He asked. She reprimanded him, shut up you blonde idiot, go and get yourself a girl of your own, while he laughed. She blushed even more when he whispered into her ear, but you have taken after Anko so much, I think it clear who the dominant one in the relationship is. Naruto felt Hana leap at him, put him in a headlock, and pull him to the ground before he could even start laughing. Hana hissed, ah you stupid blonde baka, as Naruto started to laugh. Naruto laughed and felt Hana tighten her hold on him, Hana. Chan wouldn't Anko be jealous of us being so close, he said. The three genin were alerted by his laughter and turned to see Kiba's older sister strangling Eiji's older brother. While Sakura and Sasuke were muttering something about stupid older siblings, Eiji appeared perplexed. Hana tried to strangle Naruto to death for another minute before giving up and the two stood back up. Hana sighed in frustration as Naruto smiled at her, 
But then she felt Naruto kiss her on the cheek, causing a tiny smile to spread across her face. Large, stupid blonde. It had been on Hannah's mind, so she asked, Do you think they will be ready? Eight days is not a lot of time and let's not forget who we are dealing with, she wasn't sure it would be sufficient, but she was sure they could make the genin stronger than they were. She chose to lean in and bask in his warmth after feeling him put his arm around her shoulders. Wave Country wasn't the friendliest nation. In response to his statement, I think they will be fine. It's not like we are going to let them face Zabuza after all. Hannah nodded resolutely. Either I or Kakashi will deal with Zabuza. Though she didn't enjoy the thought of her childhood friend facing off against someone like Zabuza, Hannah had to keep in mind that this was the young man who faced off against the Sandame Hokage. She knew he would be alright if he could compete with someone like him, and the others? Introspectively, Naruto tapped his chin. According to their description, the Hunter Nin can't be older than 15 or 16 years old. If we train them sufficiently, they might be able to deal with Tama at least Eiji and Sasuke. Sakura might be better off just keeping the bridge builder safe, in my opinion. I concur. Hannah eyed the girl with the pink hair and replied, I don't think she'll be ready in 8 days. Even though she has potential, it won't be fully realized in 8 days, maybe I could talk to Shizune when we return. Sakura could be a skilled med.nin because of her remarkable chakra control. Well, I hadn't considered that. Med. Nins were essential and too few in Konoha, so having one on any squad was a boon, Hannah said, and the group thoughtfully agreed. Hannah. Chan. You believe you can take care of things here for me? Hannah nodded in response to Naruto's question, but it appeared as though she was curious about his destination. Where are you going? Into the town. In addition to trying to get information from some of the thugs this gato has, I want to get a decent overview of the area. As she watched Naruto create a second clone to hold Sasuke and Eiji before he leapt away and entered the town, Hannah nodded. Town Naruto felt a range of emotions rising inside of him, from sadness to anger, and if he had been a lesser man, he would have sobbed and broken down as he strolled through waved streets. He saw people starving and homeless everywhere he looked, they were all dressed in rags and appeared to have gone weeks without taking a shower. People of all ages, from middle, aged to young children, were on the streets, looking dreary and hopeless. The so-called business tycoon Gatto had stolen everything from these people, including their homes, jobs, food, and even friends and family. He knew that the man probably didn't care at all as he sat in his pricey chair and feasted like a king. He couldn't blame the owners because they were just as much of a victim as everyone else, but he saw only hand scraps of food in what should have been a grocery store, all of which ranged in price from too high for anyone to afford. He shook his head and muttered, these people deserve better than this. He was even more incensed as he turned a corner and saw two thugs a likely two of Gatto's hired mercenaries a push a young woman while putting their blades to her pregnant belly. The taller of the two mercenaries said to the woman, you haven't paid up this week Yuka, Chan, as his head approached her too closely and he protruded his tongue to lick the side of her face. You wouldn't want that whelp in your belly to suffer any harm, would you? The shorter of the two said, causing the fabric to rip slightly as he pressed his blade to her stomach. Please, I can't afford it, the woman said, sobbing as her hands attempted to shield her bloated stomach. As hot, moist tears started to well up in her eyes, she exclaimed, I have nothing left to give. Before the dress could be pulled all the way down, though, the taller mercenary felt a sharp, excruciating pain form in his chest and noticed a pool of blood forming beneath him. Both mercenaries gave her a perverse smile. Oh I can think of something you can give us, the taller of the two told her as his hands went up to her dress and started yanking it down. What? The last thing he saw were Naruto's violet eyes before he snapped the man's neck. He choked out before a blade passed through his chest and he felt two hands around his neck. Bastard. The smaller mercenary said but was stopped immediately with Naruto picking the man up by the throat and smashing his head against the stone building beside them. Trash, Naruto muttered as he formed a clone to get rid of the bodies. He turned towards the woman who was looking at him in fear, desperately trying to protect her baby with her arms. It's okay, he told her reassuringly. I'm not here to hurt you, I just saw what they were going to do to you and stepped in to stop them, I mean you no harm. The woman gulped as she took one step closer but kept her hands on her stomach, you shouldn't have done that. Gato will find out and he will come for your head, she told him but was surprised to see him chuckle. Ma'am I'm not afraid of this Gato guy. I'm a shinobi and if he thinks mercenaries and bandits are going to scare me then he is more stupid than I already think he is. But Yua, Naruto stropped her before she could say any more. Do you have somewhere you can go? Let me walk you home. 
I don't like the idea of someone in your condition walking home with so many thugs and lowlifes around. She nodded and Naruto told her to lead the way. She tried to protest telling him she would be fine but Naruto wouldn't have it. There was no way he would let a pregnant lady who he could tell was very close to her due date run into people like those two thugs again. Not on his watch. For the next 10 minutes he walked beside her making him look like her protector with the shigur slung across his back as if asking people to just try and pull something. They walked past a few of the mercenaries and they did try to start something. But each time Naruto quickly put them in their place. They made light conversation and found out her name was Yuka and that she worked at one of the orphanages in Wave Country that she ran with a group of women and her husband. However her husband was unfortunately killed by Gato's thugs when he tried to fight back against the tax Gato put on all of them. She had gone to try and find food but her pregnancy wouldn't allow her to go very far. So when are you due? Naruto asked looking down towards her stomach and saw the woman rub her belly affectionately. Two weeks today. I'm supposed to be on bed rest but with my husband no longer with us, most of the orphanage workers have had to work double. Time with so little food and the cold nights. It doesn't help that Gato's thugs visit every few days to antagonize us. We do what we can for the children but there's only so much we can do with the little resources we have. Naruto nodded in understanding as they arrived to a large worn down looking house and windows with holes and patches on top of the roof. The fences around it was mostly destroyed and the grass and lowers around it were all but dead. You live here? Naruto asked and saw Yuka nod sadly. It used to be such a warm and loving place for the children. But now it's a shadow of itself thanks to Gato, she told him as she pushed the door open. Since Gato arrived we now have triple the amount of children living here due to Gato's mercenaries killing parents when they can't pay up. Naruto followed her inside and he quickly felt his heart break when they walked in a large living room with at least a dozen children inside it wrapped up in blankets and sleeping bags. There were more children in the next room and with his sensory abilities he could sense there were at least 50 children all cramped inside this one large building with Yuka and four other women. Yuka.san, he heard and saw the children light up when she appeared and saw them all come up to her and cuddle around her. He saw the warm look in her eyes and saw her wrap as many as she could in a hug despite her large stomach. Yuk.san thanks goodness you're safe, he heard and saw four other women appear. Two were around the same age while the other two were at somewhere in their fifties. She quickly told them about her savior and Naruto was quickly showered with gratitude and thanks from the other four women and many of the older kids. The younger ones all looked it up at him as if he was some kind of superhero. Very quickly the children all crowded around Naruto and with Naruto being the warm-hearted person he knew he was, he sat on the floor and began entertaining the children with his various shinobi tricks. For the next hour Yuka and the other workers were all smiles as they listened to the children laugh and shout out in amazement as Naruto performed trick after trick, showing them fire shaped like lil animals or using the henge to look like something funny. The biggest pop though was when he summoned a few of the younger tiger cubs for the kids to play and cuddle with. They were a big hit and he was happy Ad smiling as watched the little children play and cuddle with them, looking far happier than they did when he first walked in. Once again Naruto's heartstrings were getting pulled when a little girl no older than four with dark hair and big brown eyes found herself being drawn more and more towards Naruto. She nestled happily on his lap as she played with one of the cubs. Despite his good deed and keeping the kids entertained, Naruto wanted to do something that lasted and wanted to do something for them to protect them from Gato's thugs and make sure these children and the brave women that looked after them were kept warm. He looked around and he knew that he could definitely do something about the house. It was a wooden house and that immediately gave him an idea. As he got to his feet, he thought, now would be the ideal time if there was ever a good reason to use it. When he patted her hair, the young girl on his lap smiled again after pouting, which made him laugh. Yuka and the other women gave Naruto a funny look as he asked, Yuka.san, how helpful would it be if you had another building for the children to live in? When she told him, it would be extremely helpful since this one is falling apart, she watched in disbelief as he stood up and went outside toward the back of the house. Along with the other women and the kids who were curious about the whereabouts of the new superhero, she waddled after him. When Naruto asked the five adults, I ask that you keep what I'm about to do a secret everyone for the time being, they paused for a second before nodding. Can you kids keep a secret? They all exclaimed, yeah, which made him chuckle. Before he slammed his hands on the ground, they observed Naruto making a variety of hand gestures. As the ground shook beneath them and everyone watched in awe as four enormous houses appeared out of the ground, standing in a row and appearing as though the carpenters had just finished building them, he said, Mokotan. Renshuka no Jutsu. Although they were in much better shape, each house was the same size as the one they were in at the time. Naruto turned around and grinned at the adults, 
who could feel hot tears welling up in their eyes. I figured these four houses would provide enough room for the five of you and all the children. None of them have holes in or damaged in any way so they will be a lot warmer than this current house. He approached one of the houses and pounded his fist against it. The wood's strong so it won't be damaged very easily, it will take a lot of force to even make a dent in it. I'd say with the room sizes you could easily fit at least 30 kids in each house so you have plenty of room to spread out. The children, who had been in awe, cheered and ran towards the new homes as soon as Naruto's smile woke them up. The adults, however, hurried after them, giving him hugs and kisses on the cheek and congratulating him on being sent from heaven. A glimmer of hope returned to their once hopeless eyes as he observed how joyful they all appeared. Naruto vanished and made his way to the ocean, knowing that there was much more he could do. They all hoped to see him again, and as the afternoon was coming to an end and the orange sky emerged above them, they were granted their wish. After establishing a hierarchy for who would be in which house and where the kids would sleep, the adults all exclaimed, Who's hungry? As they emerged from each home, if they had previously been teary, eyed, they were now sobbing uncontrollably. As Naruto walked with four of his clones, which he had previously created to impress the children, they watched. They saw big nets full of recently caught fish in two of the clone's hands. They were so impressed by the sheer number of fish in each that they didn't even question how he managed to carry such a big net of them alone. Each net must have contained at least a hundred fish. The other two clones were carrying mountains and mountains of brand dot new blankets next to them. Naruto had asked Hiera to get him some new blankets for the kids that would be soft, cozy, and warm as a favor. He had always been treated well by white tiger summons, and they did so once more when they granted his request. Before he found himself dog, piled on by the kids who were all cheering his name and the adults expressing their unwavering gratitude for him, he told them, I've never fished before so I kind winged it. I hope this is enough and the blankets are courtesy of our tiger friends. There were tears of joy everywhere. When they woke up that morning, they had no idea that a stranger from a foreign nation would protect Yuka, construct four new homes for them out of the blue, catch enough fish to feed them for a week, and bring them all dozens of new blankets to keep warm. Since the houses did not yet have kitchens, he had one of his clones construct a sizable stone pit in which they could cook the fish. Not even he was able to create kitchens out of thin air. As Naruto entertained the kids once more, they all sat down and cooked the fish before starting to eat. As they gathered around the fire, they all heard Hannah say, so this is where you disappeared too. She was accompanied by her three ninkin. When he failed to show up for dinner at Tsunami's house, she became concerned and went in search of him, leaving Hayate behind with Team 7, Tazuna, and his family. Everyone was beginning to wonder where you were. Naruto could have taken care of himself, so she knew he wouldn't have been in trouble, however, she was aware that her friend had undoubtedly found a new project to focus on. With a mouthful of freshly cooked fish, he said, Hey Hannah, Chan, which caused some of the nearby children to laugh. After noticing all the joyful faces, Hannah smirked at the blonde man and said, I'm guessing this is your doing? He nodded his head in agreement as her three ninkin went to sit next to some of the kids and let them pet them. As the children joyfully ate the fish, they soon demonstrated their hunger by exclaiming, Naru, Onichan is the best, she heard them all say. Even the younger children gobbled up their food like little monsters, and the caregiver spent a good few minutes cleaning their faces. Every child received at least three helpings. One of the younger kids jabbed Naruto in the arm and gestured to Hana, who had now moved to stand next to him. She pointed to the ring finger and said, Oni, Chan is she or this? She's really pretty. Naruto threw back his head in laughter, and Hannah blushed and shook her head quickly, demonstrating that they both understood her question in a matter of seconds. The young girl simply stared at Hannah mindlessly. No no sweetie we're just friends. Good friends that's all, Hannah said. However, the girl started giggling when Naruto leaned down and whispered something in her ear. Hannah asked, what are you saying to her? But Naruto simply gave her a wink and smiled back. Hannah repeated, Naruto seriously, what did you say? But Naruto just kept grinning until he noticed the irate, savage expression on her face and saw her swat him in the head. But Naruto caught everyone's attention by dodging it and leaping off onto one of the roofs. When he asked, you really want to know Hannah? Chan? Hannah nodded her head and an impatient expression came over her face. I just told her you're secretly in love with me and that you've been trying to get me in your bed for a long time. Hannah lunged at him with a tremendous burst of speed, her eyes narrowed and slitted visible and he started to laugh before he swiftly ducked and rolled out of his way. When Naruto started to move, her body trembled with frustration and rage before she took off after him. Naruto laughed as he avoided a swipe from Hana, 
who was actively pursuing him with the goal of beating him to the ground. Don't deny our love Hannah. Chan. We can be together forever, he said. The children and adults gathered around the fires laughed at the exchange as Naruto laughed aloud and barely escaped Hannah's blow. He was expressing gratitude to Kami above for Anko's absence. Are you both prepared? Standing beside Hannah and Hayate on the treetops, high above the ground, Naruto posed the question as they gazed down on a sizable secret hideout five miles from Wave Country's main town. The three of them had spent the last seven days in Wave Country assisting the town and making sure that Eiji's genin team was prepared to face Sabuza and his accomplice. Although he helped with their food as much as they could, he knew that money was what would ultimately help this town, and they needed a lot of it. In town, Naruto's numerous clones continued fishing in the harbor and feeding the town with what he caught, which made many people happy and kept them fed every day, which was an improvement over their previous situation. The time was not right to reveal the power he somehow inherited from the Shodem Hokage, so he had secretly used his Mokuton to build more houses, a few here and there to avoid suspicion from the others. Hayate and Hana had assisted the Genin team at Tsunami's house, while Hana had spent her time with Sakura, who was incredibly weak but at least working on her physical skills because in the Shinobi world, brawn was just as important as intelligence. To that end, they increased Sakura's stamina while also making progress on expanding her chakra reserves. Hopefully, the girl had finally been woken Upa at least that was what they all hopped and they were able to at least get rid of this dumb diet she was following. After learning how to walk on water, Sasuke and Eiji were instructed to spar with each other, learning to control their chakra to keep them afloat while attempting to focus on their opponent. It took some time, but eventually they succeeded. Once Sakura's chakra was up to par, they would train her in the water walking exercise. The two boys were then instructed to concentrate on the jutsu they were already familiar with before learning a new one. So Naruto had Hayate watch over them while they practiced. This allowed them to become more proficient in their jutsu and better control the amount of chakra, which allowed them to make them more powerful with less chakra. Both boys complained about that because they believed their jutsu was already good enough, but a brief battle with Hayate proved them to be mistaken. With Kakashi, Eiji, Sasuke, and Sakura all prepared, Naruto was sure that Team 7 could contain the two of them long enough for them to reach the bridge. So, do you believe he's actually present? What if everything the guy told us was false? Hayate inquired, keeping a close eye on the building. After spotting one of Gato's thugs, the three of them decided it was time to put an end to Gato's rule in Wave Country for good. They had witnessed the devastation he had caused and knew that no one, not even a wealthy man like Gato, would be permitted to escape punishment for such heinous crimes. Naruto would not permit such a wicked individual to live another moment, taking the lives of innocent people, displacing them from their homes, and leaving them hungry and homeless. With canine. Like eyes and a growl from the triplets, Hannah replied, I know he is. I can smell him from up here. The man has an unpleasant odor. In fact, I'm excited about this. As he descended from the treetops and strode in the direction of the hiding place, Naruto replied, You and me both. Do you believe the unidentified shinobi and Zabuza are inside? Hayate asked as Hannah sniffed the air, knowing that if the Seven Swordsman member was inside, they were going to have a fight on their hands. Fortunately, Naruto was with them and had experience fighting the swordsman. Before she could respond, Naruto beat her to it. They're not. If they were, both of them would have had sizable chakra signatures, but I don't sense that anyone does. Only bandits are involved. If I understand correctly, there is absolutely no ninja training. Have they abandoned the bridge? Naruto nodded and said, it's probably. It will be all right for the team on the bridge. I'm sure that Eiji, Sasuke, and Sakura can take care of the accomplice and Kakashi can handle Zabuza. Are you worried, are you? Hana touched his elbow and asked, even though he had a grim face, she knew he must have been disturbed that his brother would be so close to a Seven Swordsman member. If it was Kiba on the bridge, she would want to be there to protect him, even if she and her younger brother weren't on the same page at the moment. It was impossible for an older sibling not to worry about their younger siblings. I am, but I have faith that Eiji will be alright. He is able to handle stressful situations and is aware of when he is over his head. Recall that our parents taught Hana. Chan. Taking a deep breath, Naruto explained, Eiji knows how to keep himself safe. In addition, I left a clone watching from a distance just in case. In this manner, if something went wrong, the clone could notify me. So, how are we going to proceed? Should we head straight for Gato's residence or sneak through the roofs and remove them one by one before we reach him? Neither. Naruto informed them as he quickly slashed the wall to pieces with his swords, opening a wide entrance for them to enter the building. 
we're going to force our way through and kill anyone who gets in our way. They both saw Naruto leap through the demolished wall and start wreaking havoc on any bandits who stood in his way. Hayate watched Hana get on all fours with her ninkin, her hair going wild and spiky, before she charged inside and could already hear her fang after fang being used to good effect. Hana smirked wildly behind him and decided to unleash her inner beast. Before drawing his sword, Hayate sighed and scratched his head. Might as well get this over with, he said to himself, coughing one final time before joining his fellow warriors. Within he was a very shot man who barely reached most people's shoulders, with light brown hair that stuck upwards and small green glasses that barely covered his eyes. He wore an expensive, looking suit and held a cane in his left hand. Get out of my way, you fool. Gato yelled as he shoved one of his hired bandits out of the way, a briefcase in his hand, yanking a painting off the wall to reveal a safe behind it. Zabuza, damn you. He opened the safe and started shoving large amounts of cash into the briefcase, muttering angrily to himself. I should have known he would fail. He didn't care if small notes fell out, all he cared about was getting his money and fleeing for his life. Before he heard the sounds of pure carnage, he heard a section of the lower walls being destroyed. He had been enjoying his day, expecting Zabuza and his apprentice to come with the news that they had finally killed the bridge builder. He promptly sent as many of his bandits as possible in the direction of the intruders, which was about 200. He assumed, though, that they were being hacked away like yesterday's dinner based on the sounds he could hear, including loud growling and barking. He tried to stuff as much as he could before reaching his limit, saying to himself, come on come on. He would have to try to return for the remainder after the intruder had either left or been killed by his thugs. When he heard the death cries grow louder and louder, he looked up, realizing that the intruders were now on the same floor as them and probably just outside his office door. Well, don't just stand there, he said turning to face the dozen thugs who had gathered in his office to guard him. Go kill them. Although the fear in his voice did not sound menacing, he demanded, I'm not paying you to just stand around and do nothing all day. None of the thugs wanted to go out there because they knew that whoever was out there could easily kill them if they had gotten past all the thugs on the lower level, so they all gulped and looked at each other anxiously. After a few seconds, one of the thugs felt a surge of courage and nodded to Gatto before running out of the room with his sword raised high and shouting a loud war cry as he left through the door. They all waited and listened as the cry abruptly stopped a second later, but then there was a loud thud on the office door, and a sword with blood smeared around the steel suddenly materialized through the wooden door. Before running across the room and opening one of the windows, Gatto told himself in his mind, I need to leave right now. He looked down and gulped when he saw the long drop to the ground. He could not possibly escape this situation with any kind of physical harm. After giving it some thought, he heard the door being smashed to pieces and saw what appeared to be three pairs of demon. Like eyes look around the room before settling on them. Purchase them. Before the thugs lunged and charged at the three shinobi, he yelled, causing them to jump. Instead of waiting to see what had happened, Gato leapt from the top of the widow and made his way directly to the ground. It felt like fire had gone up his leg and was burning him from the inside out and he didn't need to be an expert to know that his leg was probably broken from the fall. The short man dried in agony the moment he hit the ground, feeling a loud crack in his left leg before falling to the ground. He was mentally grateful for the cane at the moment, using it to support his weight, and he managed to stand with his leg dragged lifelessly after rolling around on the ground for a few seconds before remembering what was happening. When the lifeless body of one of his thugs fell beside him, glass shattered from above and he screamed as his eyes rolled back into the back of his head and his throat was sliced by a large, looking blade. Gatto pushed past the ache in his leg and hurried through the fog, covered forest, not daring to turn around for fear of the carnage and devastation that awaited him. He screamed and wailed in agony, trying to claw at the dirt before his pain sensors overloaded and two swords suddenly went through his hands, pinning him to the ground. I have to get to one of my safe houses, he told himself in his mind before a scream tore through his throat as two pairs of sharp jaws locked onto both of his legs and pulled him down to the ground. He tilted his head very slowly, pain still shooting up his throat, and looked up at his captors, his face a jumble of emotions. Hannah and Hayate were standing next to him, but Hannah was growling at him viciously, her inner beast telling her to rip this man limp from limp. Two of the triplets had their jaws on his legs, and the third was close to his face, his muzzle almost touching his face. Naruto stood in front of him his normally warm eyes now cold and emotionless, ignoring the fact that his clothes were covered in blood and that his cheeks were splattered with blood. Please don't kill me, please. Whatever you want, I'll give it to you. Slaves, women, wealth, power, anything. I can give it to you if you give me your name. He screamed, 
just don't kill me. He was desperate and didn't want to die. The powerful Gato couldn't have needed this, he still had a lot of work to do. Nothing changed on Naruto's face. Anything? Naruto inquired, hinting to Gato that there might be some hope. Yes, anything. With a smile on his face, Gato repeated, you name it, and I can do it, he might just survive. After a moment of silence, Naruto uttered the words, bring everyone you had killed back to life. Despite the pain coursing through his body, Gato felt numb as he heard those words. Of all things, it had to be the one thing that was impossible. His face fell quickly as horror and fear took over, and his skin lost all of its color. It seemed as though his life was flashing before his eyes. Before Naruto turned to face Hana, he managed to say, B, but I circa can't do that. He whispered, Hana, you know what to do. Then, as she uttered the three words Gato had never wanted to hear, Hana's face glowed with the wicked retribution of Wave Country. End him boys. The third dog's jaw was the last thing Gato saw before it lunged at him and tightened its grip around his throat, tearing the life right out of him. The death may have been violent and vomit. Worthy, but the three shinobi knew that Gato received exactly what he deserved a repulsive death for a repulsive persona and they simply stood there while Hana's ninkin literally tore him to pieces. The dogs stopped attacking after another minute, and all three of them appeared happy that they had killed the person who had hurt so many innocent people. The dog was extremely proud and happy when the three shinobi patted their heads and Hana swooned at them for taking out the villain. She was being dangerously rubbed off by Anko. After all, Naruto needed evidence that Gato was dead, so he approached the mutilated body in front of him and took his swords from Gato's hands, sheathing Shisui before quickly chopping off the Gato's head with the other. Now what? As Naruto used a fire jutsu to burn the remainder of Gato's body, Hayate questioned. Watching as Naruto made four clones and gave them instructions to return to the Gato's hideout, gather as many valuables as they could, and seal them in scrolls so that everything would go to Wave Country to help them return to peace and prosperity. Visit the bridge? Hana asked as she used a few handkerchiefs to wipe the triplet's muzzles and remove the blood from her face and the faces of her allies. The bridge? Before they leapt into the trees and took off, Naruto told them, we have a favor of goodwill to fulfill first. Gato's burning body remained on the ground and turned into nothing more than a pile of ash. The bridge as they stood inside a huge dome of ice mirrors, Eiji yelled, damn it Sasuke stop trying to fight him all on your own. Sasuke was pushed back next to Eiji, and they were covered in cuts and bruises. The Uchiha's expression was one of annoyance and rage the moment they were trapped inside this ice dome. Their enemy, Zabuza Momochi's accomplice, was stronger than they initially believed, and because of their heavy clothing and face mask, they were unable to determine if their opponent was male or female, all they knew was that their name was Haku. The fact that they soon learned their opponent had a bloodline at the Hyden bloodline, which gave Haku the ability to combine wind and water to create an ice affinity and made their battle even more challenging. When a huge spear of ice was thrown at them from one of the mirrors in front of him, the black, haired boy quickly ducked and rolled to the side, and Eiji did the same before the two watched as Haku appeared in each of the ice mirrors as though they were being taunted. Get out of my way idiot, Sasuke demanded. As he openly glared at their opponent, Sasuke's eyes spun quickly, he was very proud of himself for having just a few moments ago awakened his Sharingan, which was a sign that he was growing stronger and would soon be able to outshine his brother at least that's what he liked to think as one Tomo appeared in his left eye and two in his right. Both John and level shinobi were giving it their all in the battle between Kakashi and Zabuza, which they could hear from a short distance away, hidden in the mist. They could hear the mighty sword of Zabuza and the grin of Kakashi's kanai. They also knew that Sakura, who may not have been particularly strong, was doing everything in her power to keep the bridge builder safe, even if it meant a little something to Sasuke. It's unfortunate. The son of the fourth Hokage and Uchiha was not what I expected. Haku mockingly said, I guess I was wrong, as ice. Based Senbons materialized in her Hansa in fact, in every mirror. My name is Uchiha. No one is better than us, Sasuke declared passionately as Eiji emerged behind him, standing back. To, back. Stop talking, Sasuke. Teme. She is attempting to agitate you so that you will commit more errors. Namikaze, please speak up, I don't require your assistance. Yes, you do. This person cannot be defeated by us alone. Since his Sharingan awoke, Eiji felt as though Sasuke's pride and ego were suddenly boosted. If they survived this, he was not looking forward to putting up with Sasuke for the foreseeable future. We need to work together, Eiji encouraged, but Sasuke was blatantly ignoring him. Eiji felt as though he was speaking to a brick wall when Sasuke said, maybe you can't but I'm a Uchiha. 
Why did Uchiha people need to have sticks up their asses? Why couldn't he be more like Itachi and his aunt Makoto? Sasuke's Sharingan and Eiji's excellent reflexes, which his father had instilled in him regarding reflexes and dodging attacks, were the only reasons the two of them were able to avoid the next round of senbons that were thrown at them. Fighting amongst one another is a surefire way to fail. When you are fighting with each other, how can you win? Before she leapt out of the mirror and struck Sasuke, Haku gestured, but Eiji was able to block her blow with his forearms when she reached him. Sasuke used a fire jutsu and Eiji hurled his shurikens at the ice user, but Haku swiftly retreated into the ice mirror to avoid their reach. Look, as he hurried back to back with Sasuke, Eiji hissed at him, even our enemy thinks our teamwork sucks. As if I give a damn about what this person thinks. Sasuke ran through his hand signals and declared, I will not be beaten by the likes of you. He called, Kaden. Ha Senka no Jutsu. He then threw flower. Shaped fireballs out of his mouth, which struck several of the ice mirrors. When Sasuke realized his Jutsu had no effect and that his opponent was still unharmed and had not even a burn mark on his clothing, his face instantly changed from one of a smile to one of incredulity and rage. How do they have such strength? He should be stronger than this, he was a Uchiha. Sasuke hissed, not understanding what he was doing wrong. What Kakashi? Sensei said was heard by you. There are people our age who are just as strong as him all over the world. Perhaps even more powerful. After all, take a look at Itachi and Naruto. Even though he knew it wouldn't help their predicament, Eiji told him, they're only 18, Itachi is already an Anbu captain, and Naruto managed a draw with the Sandane. You ought to pay attention to your friend. Before sprinkling them with more iced senbons, Haku told him, he sounds a lot smarter than you are. However, neither of them was as fortunate as the last time and managed to land a senbon or two. Eiji had three in his right leg and Sasuke had two in his left arm. Both of them winced and felt their limbs go numb as the senbons struck particular nerve points. Sasuke's temper was only getting worse when Eiji muttered, now we're really in trouble. He tried using one handed hand signals because his arm was numb, but Eiji quickly grabbed his arm and pushed it down. Avoid being foolish. You risk hurting yourself if you try that. Sasuke growled in frustration as Eiji told him, if you can't use single-handed hand signs, don't try without someone more experienced. To his surprise, Eiji nodded his head when Sasuke asked, well, do you have any bright ideas Namikaze? I do, but we must cooperate. I may be able to put this person down with my jutsu, but in order to divert Haku's attention, I will need your assistance, he said to Sasuke, who put aside his pride for the moment as Eiji whispered in his ear. Haku watched the two boys talking and realized she would have to be on her guard because she knew she couldn't afford to make a mistake if either of them was like their forebears. She had more senbons in her hands and was ready to release them when she saw Eiji shout, Cage Bunshin no Jutsu, and make the ram hand sign. Twenty solid replicas of Eiji materialized in a puff of air, and Haku watched as they all started to fly around the confined area, kicking and punching at the iced mirrors. Your attempts are in vain. My chakra is infused into these ice mirrors, making them stronger. Haku told them in a dull voice, you can't break them with fists and feet. He had assumed that their prior attempts to confront her mirrors directly were sufficient proof. As Haku quickly became frustrated with these repeated attempts, the copies ignored her and went on, proving that she was mistaken to have such high expectations for a challenge with these two genin. Sensatsu Suisha. As dozens and dozens of iced senbons materialized in her hands, ready to be hurled at her adversary once more, she gave the order. There were enough senbons to level a small village if needed, and these two boys would not be able to avoid the quantity she was about to throw at them. However before she could she watched as Sasuke threw an akanai before her towards the fighting clones with an explosion tag lighting up behind it. An explosion quickly sounded out and caught the attention of the others. It sounds like Haku is enjoying himself with your student Kakashi, Zabuza said pausing his altercation with Kakashi for a moment to smile from under the bandages covering his mouth. I doubt they will last much longer at this rate. Haku is known for being quite cruel. Don't write my students off just yet Zabuza. They are stronger than they appear. They are of the Uchiha and Namikaze families. Kakashi told him before the two rushed each other, sparks flying off their weapons as they met. Haku covered her eyes. The explosion as well as the smoke from the destroyed clones had caused her vision to become very limited and couldn't see her toe opponent. Staring inside the ice mirror was causing her no vision and tentatively leaned part of her body out of the mirror the real her was residing in. Where are they? She thought before she saw the shadow of Sasuke Uchiha appear and saw him throw kanai and shuriken towards with his one good arm towards her. 
Not thinking about looking for the other boy she deflected each strike with her ice made senbons. All except one that was off target and sailed past her iced mirrors. Sasuke was barely standing, he had been a little too close to the explosion and had black soot covering his body. The fight was beginning to tax him more and more. All you have done was slow down the inevitable. I will now end you now just as as Zabuza. Sama has commanded. Haku told them only to realize that with the smoke now disappear, Eiji was now missing from the Dome of Ice. Haku now leaned her entire body out of the mirrors to get a better look, neither boys were likely in any condition to fight her properly now, it was time she landed the final blows to them before making her way over to the bridge builder and their pink haired comrade. Where is he? Uchiha.san. Sasuke face slowly lifted up to meet her and surprised Haku when she saw he had a light smirk on his face while breathing heavily, why don't you ask him yourself? Haku looked confused before she heard a puff of a transformation technique occur behind her while the sound of swirling could also be heard, making her eyes widen as a brght blue light could be seen from behind her. She turned her body around only to find Eiji inches away from her with a glowing ball of chakra in his right hand. Rasengan. The attack hit straight in the stomach of Haku, causing a mixture of saliva and blood to spit out of her mouth and run from under the mask. She spiraled through the air, crashing through the very ice mirrors she created before crashing to the ground hard. Gotcha. Eiji muttered as he breathed hard before he fell to the ground panting hard. He crawled over to the side of the bridge and watched as the rest of the ice mirrors around Sasuke felt and smashed to pieces as they fell to the ground. Sasuke looked a little wide-eyed at Eiji while feeling a pang of jealousy appear in his stomach before he too fell to the ground as his previous chakra exertion finally hit him. It looks like my two students defeated your Zabuza. Kakashi said as he glared at Zabuza who stood in front of him with his great sword clashing with one of Kakashi's kunais. Sparks flew off the metal as they continued to press all their strength into the attacks. Don't get cocky Kakashi. It's not over yet. Zabuza taunted before pushing Kakashi away and went through a number of hand seals. Mizu Bunshin no Jutsu. Dozens of water clones appeared around him and all immediately lunged at Kakashi who covered his right hand in lighting with his Chidori. Just try it. It's time I stopped holding back. Kakashi taunted back. He zoned in on the real Zabuza with his Sharingan, intensifying the Chidori in his right hand and preparing to land the final blow. He watched the clones rush forward and knowing that the jutsu would have zapped a portion of Zabuza's chakra away. Waiting until the moment was right, Kakashi shot forward at such speed that Zabuza was momentarily caught of guard. The Jonin from Konoha sped through the clones of Zabuza before any one of them could strike Kakashi with the mighty sword. Zabuza could only watch as the Kakashi destroyed before he could feel the sparks from the attack hitting him from where he stood. This is your end Zabuza, just like I said. Kakashi told him as he got within just a few feet from the Swordsman of the Mist. Rakery. Wait. Kakashi heard as he got close to Zabuza who was looking at the copy ninja with surprised eyes at how fast he truly was and seeing how close to death he was with Kakashi attacks only inches away from his chest. A bead of sweat quickly ran down his face at knowing he had almost been bested once again by Kakashi. Zabuza and Kakashi watched as Naruto, Hana and Hayate appeared a couple of meters away all still covered in the blood of the mercenaries at Gato's hideout. All three had a serious look on their faces before Naruto sent Hana to heal up Eiji and Sasuke while Hayate went to ensure Sakura and the bridge builder were okay. Zabuza Momochi, Demon of the Hidden Mist? Zabuza took a good look at the young man beside him before realizing who he was. Konoha's bladed devil, kid, what do you want? The remark that he was a child made Naruto angry but he briefly dismissed it and withdrew a scroll from one of the seals on his wrists before tossing it to Zabuza, who swiftly grasped it and opened it. Naruto, what are you doing? Kakashi asked, but his sensei's oldest son, who was watching Zabuza, did not respond. When reading the contents of the scroll, the demon of the mist remained silent for a minute before looking up from the scroll and asking, and this is real? Is this serious? He asked at last, and Naruto nodded in agreement. Placing his hand on the hilt of Shisui, Naruto shook his head and said, Zabuza Momochi, I have been asked to inform you that it is time for you to return home on the special orders of Meijurumi, the fifth Mizukage. Now that Yugura's rule is over, Kirigakure needs your assistance to rebuild. Naruto pulled out Shisui and aimed it at Zabuza, saying, If you should turn down this offer, I will kill you right there. Zabuza was nearly alarmed by Naruto's icy gaze and had to swallow out his breath. It sent a chill down Kakashi's spine as well. Decide, now. That's it for today, I hope you guys enjoyed this great story, see you in the next one.